On my way home from work, I noticed a gas station that shouldn't be there. I had driven home this way a hundred of times and there was never a gas station there before. I nudged my best friend Adam who I had carpooled to work with and he woke up immediately. Huh, what? He said groggily and I slowed down the car pointing my finger. That gas station doesn't belong here, I said pointing. Yeah, I guess not. And prepared to go back to sleep. I nudged him again. Let's go check it out. It says 24 hours on it. I said. He yawned and then nodded his head. Alright, sure, if it'll make you leave me alone so I can get some sleep. I'll go and check it out with you, he said, feeling around his pockets for some tobacco. I'm not sure what you're so excited about it for. It's just a gas station. He always hand-rolled his own cigarettes on the spot, even putting a little menthol filter into the rolling paper. He lit up the Turkish tobacco, waking up instantly as the sweet smell of it drifted through the car. Well, it's a gas station that wasn't there yesterday, I pointed out. How did it go up so fast? That's not even physically possible. Oh, clearly it is because it's there. He pointed out. I pulled into the parking lot looking at the sign. It sets a 24 hour service. It read simply. The bright fluorescent lights flickered as we pulled up to a pump and got out. Adam grabbing his nearly empty backpack and putting it on without thinking. And then grabbing his keys with a detachable pepper spray canister. His lighter and some tobacco. Something skittered behind the gas station just out of reach of the lights. A sudden smell of sulfur and rotty meat wafted over to us, making me gag. Oh, bro, Adam said, covering his mouth and nose with his hand. That is just terrible. I nodded, putting my face in the crook of my elbow, trying not to breathe the disgusting fumes. We both walked quickly towards the door, opening it up and going inside. Instantly, the smell was gone. As the door closed behind me, I realized that this was not a normal gas station. Row after row of mannequin heads were lined up in the aisle in front of me, as if they were all for sale. Some of them looked like they had actual human eyes inserted into the plastic. Bits of red still dribbled down them from the eyes. One had its mouth open a bloody tongue inserted into the silently screaming statue. Whoa, that is awesome, Adam said, pointing to the mannequins as if they were Halloween decorations. I grabbed his arm. I think we need to get out of here, I said, a rising sense of trepidation sending off alarm bells in my head. It's only decorations, man, Adam said laughing. Clearly this is some sort of Halloween store or something. Kind of out of season, though. He shrugged. And I shook my head and tried backing up towards the door. Turning around, I realized that it had locked behind us. I tried pulling it with all my might, looking for any locks or buttons near it, but there was nothing. It had metal bar after metal bar crisscrossing it vertically and horizontally, as if to keep vandals out, or to keep unwilling hostages in. We're locked in. I said simply, my voice wavering. This isn't right, Adam. We need to get out of here. The panic in my voice seemed to wake him up to our situation, but he still tried to pretend like this was just a normal store. We just need to find somebody that works here, he said calmly. They probably locked it by mistake. We both began looking around and I realized that the store looked much larger on the inside than it did from the outside. There, he said, pointing to a glass case on the far side of the store. A man stood there with dark, nearly black eyes, staring at us from inside the bulletproof glass partition. We walked over. I noticed row after row of horrors on our way. One aisle had what looked like medieval devices, all dripping red and covered in it. I even saw what looked like intestines wrapped around some metal spikes. 
with the handle to turn the metal that apparently draw the intestines out of somebody. The next row was taxidermied animals, well at least at first. There were foxes, cats, dogs, and beavers, all frozen in ferocious positions, their eyes wild and their teeth bared. As I looked farther down, I saw the bodies of people frozen in eternal screams of horror, still wearing their dresses or suits. The heads of men and women were also taxidermied and set side by side on the aisles, all cast with different expressions, some of them smiling, some shrieking, some just staring blankly ahead with dull eyes. I stopped looking down the aisles after that. May I help you? The cleric said through the holes in the plastic as we neared. His dead eyes stared at Adam before flicking over to me. I think we're locked in, I said, my voice weak. The man's eyes had never left mine. I looked down at my hands. The only way out is further in. He pointed to the back of the store. The way you exit is not the way you enter. It is below. What is this, some sort of riddle? Adam asked, fuming. Just let us out of here, man. We don't want to buy any of your weird stuff. Who the heck wants to buy a bunch of mannequin heads or taxidermied beavers and a cat of nine tails? And the clerk just stared at Adam with his black eyes. Look, if you're not going to let us out, I'm going to smash my way out. And the clerk smiled at this but said nothing. Adam shrugged and went to the medieval devices aisle. I found it odd that they sold all these random horrifying objects, but I didn't see any food, snacks, or drinks in the entire place. Perhaps those were all further ahead in some spot that we hadn't discovered yet. Adam grabbed a mace, a thick piece of polished wood with a spiked metal ball on the end. He went over to the door that we came in through and with one final glance back at the cleric. He began smashing the maze as hard as he could into the glass panels of the entryway. He quickly found out that it was made of some sort of shatterproof plexiglass. The first swing reverberated painfully back into his arm, causing him to nearly drop the maze. Then he moved over to the windows and tried smashing those out, with the same result. I checked my phone for service to see if I could call the police, but... All the metal and bulletproof glass apparently affected the signal. I had zero reception inside the station. It looked more and more like we were going to have to play the clerk's little game. We would have to go deeper inside to find a way out, as he had told us. I was quickly regretting ever stepping foot in this bizarre place. Adam massaged his right arm painfully. The shock waves from hitting the unbreakable glass having clearly caused some minor aches, but he still held the mace in one hand. You better grab a weapon too, Adam said to me, his eyes serious, his normal joking manner totally dissipated. We have no idea what this place is, but I think it's better safe than sorry. I nodded, going to the medieval devices and the weapons aisle, and picking up a scimitar. The curved sword felt somehow comfortable in my hand, the weight of the metal blade perfectly balanced. I gave it a few practice swings and then turned back to him. Well, let's get going, I said. We began walking down an aisle with books wrapped in some white leathery substance that looked suspiciously like human skin. I eyed them with distaste as we passed. I saw the Necronomicon, the Shadows of Solomon, the Malice and Maleficarum, the Wiccan Book of Shadows, and many other tomes that I didn't recognize. Some weren't even written in the Latin alphabet, but looked as if they were Tibetan or Sanskrit titles instead. Adam stopped, grabbing a random grimoire that had caught his attention. On the front, it simply read, The Angel of Death, in huge silver letters. The book itself was shiny and black like a poisonous snake. A blood-red eye stared out from the bottom of it, and I saw that it dripped blood continuously, as if the book itself was crying. He tucked it into his backpack. 
what are we going to do with that? I asked nervously, and he shrugged. My gut told me to take it. I don't know why. Maybe if we stop, I can look at it closer. As we neared the back of the massive store, which was bigger than any department store that I had ever been in, I began to smell the rotting meat and sulfur once again. I looked around warily. You've got your game face on, bro. Adam asked me, also smelling the nauseating mixture. I nodded grimly. We both had our medieval weapons out and ready to swing at anything that came near us. But nothing attacked. Instead, we saw a black silhouette in the back, next to a flight of stairs leading downwards. As we got closer, the features of the silhouette became clearer. It stood over ten feet tall, nearly scraping its head on the ceiling. It had a shimmering reptilian skin, with the dark red claws on its hands and feet, but its most distinctive feature were its eyes. They glowed like embers, brightening and dimming with every passing second as the creature stared us down. Its hairless face had tiny slits for its nose and ears, and a lipless black mouth that formed a perfectly straight line. Adam went first, looking up at the creature suspiciously. This is the way, friends. It said to us in a guttural, cracking voice, gesturing with a clawed hand to the stairway. I will see you again further in, in the space where the light grows cold and distant. My name is Set, and I greet all the fighters up above, as above, as so below. As he spoke, he began to walk backwards, and he faded into the wall, until only his glowing ember eyes remained, watching our every move. Adam went first, walking very softly and giving furtive glances to the eyes seemingly embedded into the wall. I walked behind. The stairway smelled musty and ancient reminded me of the times that I had visited the catacombs in Paris, and it descended for what looked like dozens of stories, tiny cramped steps disappearing into the dark far below. We used our cell phones for light, going slow so as to not slip. It would be a very long and likely lethal fall to the bottom. The lower we went, the colder it became, until I could see my breath in the dim light of the phone. There was no hand roll or anything to grab if I slept. The wall was smooth as sandstone, and as we went lower, many of the stairs were crumbling. My fear of heights made me start to hyperventilate, until Adam turned and calmed me down. Just focus on one step at a time, he said. Don't look beyond that. After what felt like an eternity... We reached a long hallway. We sped up, walking through it. It opened like a huge antechamber, the size of a football stadium. As soon as we stepped foot into it, a stone door slammed shut behind us, keeping us from going back the way that we had come. Both of us jumped at the loud slamming sound turning abruptly. From behind me, a thin hand grabbed my hair retching my head back and putting a cold metal blade to my throat. Adam raised his weapon, but the man behind me simply laughed. His breath smelled like he was rotting from the inside. Combined with the intense odor of sweat, it emanated off of him and it made me want to gag. But I knew that I couldn't move a single millimeter with that sharp knife pressing into my jugular. And put your weapon down, mate. The man said in an Australian accent, Both of you. I dropped my sword on the floor with a loud echoing clatter, and Adam immediately dropped his mace on the ground, putting his hands up to show that they were empty. Don't kill him, Adam said. We've done nothing to you. The man laughed. Do you know where you are? He said. It doesn't matter what you've done or not done. This is a place of death. No one leaves here alive. The tip of the blade pressed into my skin and I felt a few drops of blood begin to run down my neck. Both of you move forward. We began to walk into the huge chamber. Torches flickered on the walls. Up ahead, I heard the insane laughter of a woman. 
finger painting, finger painting, just like when I was a kid. She said, also in a deep Australian accent. The insane rambling echoed back to us, and I could barely tell where it was coming from. After what felt like an eternity, I saw an emaciated, sickly-looking young woman. She appeared to be of mixed race with tan skinned and long hair. She wore the remnants of rags on her thin body. She reminded me of videos of camp survivors that I had seen. I could count every one of her ribs. Next to her, she had a cooked strip of skin and occasionally stopped and took a bite out of it, smiling and cooing with pleasure at the taste. Long pork, she whispered and then laughed. The smell of rot was overwhelming. It was so thick that I felt like I could taste it. I could see bodies strewn around her. She had cut off their fingers and was using the thick, clotting red to attach them to the walls. I saw dozens of fingers forming random patterns all up and down the wall. Some of them were so old that the skin was falling off, the nails having turned black or purple from the decay. We got some fresh meat, baby girl, the man said with an insane laugh. The woman turned to look at us and I could see in her eyes that she was totally insane as well. She barely focused on anything for more than a second. Her eyes flitted around randomly, as if she was seeing things moving all around us that weren't there. The bodies around her had already been stripped, and it seemed clear that they had been eating pieces from all of them. The waves of nausea and sickness in my stomach only grew worse. But then out of nowhere, what sounded like a tornado siren began to sound. I felt the knife loosen slightly around my throat, and the woman looked up, shrieking in horror. No, not again, she said. Adam noticed the distraction, his eyes meeting mine. He nodded, reaching into his pocket. Down, Adam shrieked, and I grabbed the man's hand, forcing it further away from my throat with all my strength and then I fell to the floor. At the same instant, Adam took out the police mace from his pocket and began spraying it in a concentrated stream into the insane Aussie's face. The lunatic screamed and fell, dropping the knife as I crawled away on the disgusting floor. Within a space of seconds, my clothes and skin were covered. I gagged, trying not to throw up. The woman ran over to the man, trying to pull him up. They're coming, they're coming, she said. But he was in such bad pain that he couldn't even open his eyes, less likely to run from whatever horrors existed at these lower levels. Adam wrenched the knife from the man's hand, kicking him a few times for good measure, and then turned to the woman. She barely weighed 100 pounds from the look of her, and it wasn't hard to overpower her. Lead us out of here, you nut job, he said to her, and she began screaming. No time, no time. We can't leave my daddy, she wept, the tears forming lines between the dirt and what was caking her face. Adam stuck the knife into her back for good measure and she yelped. Lead us out of here or you'll be dead, he said. She nodded, her crying stopping abruptly, then pointed to a small opening in the wall further down, past the pile of bodies that had surrounded her. Adam let her go and she began to run, both of us closely following. I heard a cacophony of fluttering wings and saw what looked like huge dragonflies descending from further down the chamber. All three of us ran into the opening just as they had passed us by, the swarm focusing on the crying man as he tried to get to his feet and follow us. With a scream like somebody being burned alive, I heard them swarm all over him. A few of the dragonfly-like bees followed us down the tunnel, and I felt a stinging sensation, like burning fire as one of them bit me in the back of the neck. I slapped at it, feeling a stinger hit my hand directly in the center of my left palm. It began to swell, and it took everything that I had in me to not scream. I grabbed the thing and I pulled it in front of me, and with horror, I realized that it had a tiny human-like face on it. The face had no eyebrows or hair, but it was forced into a perpetual scream. I threw it on the ground and I stomped on it. 
run, I said, and we sprinted away, the screams of the man following us down the tunnel. It split off at various points, but the insane woman seemed to know where she was going, taking a left and then the next right. Soon, we could see the light of the sun ahead of us. We emerged into a massive courtyard. The walls stood hundreds of feet tall and creatures in cages lined them. Some of them looked like they had been fused together from multiple bodies. Others looked like men and women dressed in suits or hiking clothes, but their faces were totally blank, with no hair, eyes, ears, or mouth. Their heads turned to watch us as we passed, however. The insane woman started crying. Don't want to be here. Don't want to be here, she said. Ah, shut up, Adam said to her. He looked at me. So what now? I pulled out my phone and tried calling the police, but there was no ability to call their text. But an open Wi-Fi network came through reading. Sets, a full service station. I tried to open up websites for the FBI or police agencies to call for help, but they were all blocked. Yet I was able to access this site, and so I started writing up my story. I know that there's only one way out and that's further in. That is, if Set wasn't lying to us, the horrors that await us seem like they will only grow worse. As my friend Adam and I stood in the gargantuan courtyard, surrounded by hundreds of monstrous beings in cages, we wondered what we should do next. We looked at the insane woman. Her dark hair hung in matted, bloody strings around her face, and her eyes were hollow and blank. She looked past us with a thousand yard stare. Adam walked up to her, standing only a foot away from him so she couldn't look past him. What's your name? He asked softly. She muttered to herself, but I couldn't hear what she was saying. He pointed at me. This is my friend Jerry and my name is Adam. She suddenly sprang to attention, her lifeless doll eyes meeting his gaze. A fleeting moment of lucidity and sanity seemed to return to her. My name is Mary, and you killed my father. Adam shook his head. Technically, those mutant bugs killed your father, he responded. And that was only after you guys tried to take us and eat us. At least I assume that was what your final goal was. He said this in such a deadpan, emotionless way that I had to resist the urge to laugh. But I think we need to focus on the present issue. Where are we? He pointed around at the creatures in the cages. Many of them looked at us, at least with those eyes. Some looked human, but had no hair, eyes, or mouth, a nose or ears on their heads. They seemed to breathe through their skin. A slight expansion and contraction rippling through their body every few moments. Unexpectedly, with a loud clattering that echoed off the walls of the courtyard, three teenagers came running through a small tunnel on the other end of the room. I hadn't noticed the tunnel entrance, as it was hidden from my view by closely spaced cages. One of the kids had deep claw marks down his chest. His t-shirt was in tatters and blood ran in rivulets down the white cloth, turning it into a deep red. The two girls behind him were breathing hard, their eyes wide, looking behind them every few seconds. And then they saw us before noticing all the creatures in cages all around the courtyard, and they went as still as statues. The insane woman, Mary, took advantage of the moment of distraction and ran away back in the direction that we had come. Dang, Adam said, about to sprint after her. I put my hand on his shoulder. Let her go, I said. Realistically, what are we going to do? We either have to keep her around, which means having to constantly watch a lunatic who would kill us in a second, or we would have to tie her up or even do the same to her. None of those are good choices, and... I don't even want the blood of a lunatic on my hands if I can help it. It's probably just better to let her go. And of course, I had a feeling that we would be seeing her again, 
though I didn't say this out loud. The teenage boy with the shirt walked forward, putting his hands out to show that he was unarmed. Adam kept the knife in his right hand and covertly shoved his keys with the police mace towards me with his other hand. I took them, turning the nozzle to the firing position, so at least we would have one ranged weapon to gain an advantage if this group turned out to be as insane as Mary and her father. But as they inched closer, I realized they were just scared kids. I stepped forward, putting the keys in my pocket and showing them my hands. We're not going to hurt you, I said loudly, my voice echoing through the courtyard. The monster nearest to me, a man in a surgeon's uniform with pure white cataract-covered eyes, stared towards me, agitated by my yelling. Where do you come from? We found this place in Florida, the boy said, walking forward and wincing as he wiped his hand across the deep cuts on his chest. And we found it in Massachusetts, Adam said. Was it a random-looking gas station that appeared out of nowhere? The boy looked uncertain. Well, we had never been in that part of Florida before, he said. It was a road trip across the states. We were going to Universal and Disney World and got a little bit lost. We were low on gas and found a 24-hour station in the middle of a swamp on some dirt road with no houses around for miles. I thought that it was weird, but beggars can't be choosers, right? We went inside to pay and the door is locked behind us. I nodded. Yeah, mostly the same story for us, I said. Except I know for a fact that this gas station showed up in less than a day. For all I know, it may have just appeared in seconds. And I'm willing to bet if we talked to more people here, they would have similar stories except they all probably came from different locations. The last group that we ran into sounded like they had Australian accents, and I would be willing to bet that if we went further in, we would find people from all over. This thing must be showing up randomly across the world and letting people in. It's like a lobster trap. Once you get in, you can't get out, but you have to keep going deeper and deeper inside to look for a way out. Until what? Adam said. The lobster fisherman catches us and lets us out. I laughed. The fishermen only let the lobsters out when they're ready to boil them alive. I said, and he frowned at this. Do you guys have any weapons? One of the girls interrupted. She was a short and skinny redhead. Adam pointed back the way that we had come. There are a couple weapons back in the chamber there. But I wouldn't head that way, he said. There were bugs who eat people alive. But somehow there was a warning first, almost like a trap had been set off. It sounded like a tornado siren or something. She nodded. Yeah, it was the same with us. We took the stairs down and ended up finding a small tunnel immediately off to the left under the torches. As soon as Jason had stepped past the first stone, though, the wailing sound had started, and something came out of the walls. The boy named Jason continued her story. It was all hunched over and it looked like there was a secret trap door built into the wall, and then a smell like sulfur and roadkill came out, like a wave of stench, and it took these huge claws and swiped my chest. He lifted his shirt and I gasped. The blood hadn't started to clot, but still kept running down in streams. He must have lost quite a bit by this point, but the adrenaline seemed to keep him going. Black and purple lines went out from the cuts in all directions, reminding me of a wound that had gone septic. As I watched, I could see it worsen moment by moment. Pieces of his skin began to fall off, bones morphing and ripping through his clothes. God, it hurts. Please, something is wrong, Jason said, reaching out towards me. Droplets began to fall from his right eye and then his left one, and he started screaming as his body began to transform into something else. The third girl in the group, a tall brunette teenager, began to point behind Jason and scream. I saw a glimpse of a shorter, red-headed teenage girl, identical to the one in the group except this one was missing multiple fingers 
and her clothes were all torn as well. Blood poured out of her hand where the stumps of the fingers reflexively tightened and loosened on nothing. She looked like she had been stung over and over, her face swollen. The doppelganger looked at the whole one in shock as Jason fell to the floor. His scream stopped with the pieces of bone had started to grow out of his back. He writhed and seized, his eyes rolling into the back of his head and coming back to focus on me a couple more times. Who are you? The injured redhead said to the uninjured one, who showed an ear-to-ear -ear grin and began to float above the ground. Her eyes had turned red like flaming embers, and her skin began to rapidly darken into a black sheen. Her body grew, the legs and arms lengthening as all the clothes began to be reabsorbed inside the body of the monster. The injured girl screamed as a floating set reached out his arm towards her, softly rubbing the side of her swollen cheek before quickly grabbing her by the jaw and snapping her. The sound of the bone fracturing and the look of horror and torment in that girl's eyes were haunting. The brunette girl had used the distraction to run over next to Adam and me. Sat turned his gaze back towards us, ignoring Jason who was still having a seizure on the ground, spitting out foam. You both intrigued me, he said to Adam and me in a guttural tone. It seemed to come from the walls around us as well as his reptilian mouth. But especially you, he said pointing to me. I will make a deal with you, Jerry. You give me your soul and I will tell you the way to the exit at the center of the labyrinth. I shook my head at this. How about you go screw yourself? I said, spiteful. The sad only laughed. Behind him, Jason had stopped seizing and now looked to be either unconscious or gone. Well, in that case, said Sad, out of a spirit of fairness, I will give you three survivors a five-minute head start before. He pointed to the cages around us at the sides of the courtyard, smiling. The brunette girl gasped, her mouth a small O of fear. You wouldn't, she said, starting to cry. Set laughed at this and put his hands up towards the sky. Adam grabbed one of her hands and they followed my lead as I sprinted towards the tunnel that Mary had taken earlier. I hoped that maybe we could find her again and force her to show us the way towards the center of this maze of horrors, where Set had claimed freedom lay. As we ran into the dark, cramped tunnels, glowing symbols that hadn't been there before began to illuminate the path in front of us. We came out to the massive chamber where we found Mary weeping over the body of her father. Her clothes were in tatters and her back scarred with countless tiny symbols that had been engraved into her skin. They reminded me of Tibetan scripts that I had seen, or the constructed elvish language in Lord of the Rings. The body of her father was swollen to twice its normal size, small dribbles of a clotted red coming out of his face, ears, nose, and mouth. I saw hundreds of the human-faced insects around his body. Many of them crushed or their wings ripped off. It looked as if he had gone down fighting. I wondered where the mutated bugs had gone, but time was running short and I knew that that would be a mystery better left for another time. Adam grabbed Mary by the shoulder and rapidly explained the situation. Her eyes dried up and even though she seemed to look past us at invisible shadow people or whatever other hallucination or insane mind made up, she understood enough of it. And then Seth's voice echoed all around us, coming from nowhere and everywhere. Time is up, friends, he said, a tone of glee and amusement in his voice. Open the cages, release the wanderers. From very far off, I heard metal doors slamming open, and I knew that we had to act. Mary, show us the way to the safest room you know, I said. We need time to think and, except at that moment, time had run out. We had encountered on the demonic form of Jason, 
tearing out of the darkness at a superhuman speed and jumping on the brunette girl. He began to slash and rip at her with huge black talons. His body was hunched, spikes sticking out of his spine. His lips were missing, showing huge, bloody teeth instead, and his eyes and skin had turned a pure, sickly white. The deep claw marks on his chest totally healed now. Adam tried stabbing at the monster with his small dagger, but then I remembered that we had weapons only a few feet away, where we had first been abducted. I ran towards the door, grabbing my scimitar. As the monster was focused on ripping the brunette girl to pieces, I came up from behind it and swung as hard as I could. Time seemed to slow down as the sword had connected with its neck, and the inertia took it deeper and deeper. The monster uttering a final shriek that was cut off at the same time as its throat was severed. The head fell to the floor, the white eyes still looking up at me with hatred, the lipless mouth still opening and closing, like a fish suffocating on land. The lump body of the monster fell backwards, showing the damage to the girl beneath. She was not yet dead. I knew that it was only a matter of moments, though. Her throat had been slashed and pieces of skin on her chest were missing, and I could see spurts of bright red exiting out of a dozen deep gashes every time that her heart beat. She tried to speak, but she only choked on her own words. She died with her eyes open, staring in fear and horror. We have to go, Adam said pulling on my arm. I saw that he had gone and grabbed his maze from in front of the locked door 20 feet away, and I realized that he was right. I could hear footsteps approaching down the same tunnel that we had taken. Mary was clearly agitated even more than usual, and was gibbering and saying something unrecognizable. Adam prodded her in the back and whispered something to her, and she nodded and began running. We both followed her closely behind. She took us to a completely different tunnel. This one went further down in a spiraling ramp. We ran for at least 10 minutes and the ramp never leveled off. Torches lined the walls on both sides, giving us light. I wondered at just how many stories beneath the ground we were now. It had to have been hundreds. Finally, after what felt like over a mile of descending, we came to a cave system that seemed to glow within its own inner blue light. Stalagmites and stalactites made sharp spikes on both sides of us. Mary pointed to a small door to the right that had been hewn from the rock itself. It had a symbol on it that I had never seen before, resembling a spiral with an arrow pointing up. That means food, Mary said in a hushed voice. There are a few of these rooms, though many of them have traps in them. She pushed through, and showed us a room filled with cans and bottles. Most of them were empty and thrown to the side, but I saw dozens more were still unopened along the metal shelving of the back wall. Adam and I quickly shut the door and looked at the food supplies. I realized that I was starving. All of the running and adrenaline had exhausted me and just the thought of food made my mouth begin to water. We quickly opened up some cans of tuna fish and found some bottles of soda in the corner. While all three of us ate and drank as quickly as we could, we tried to formulate a plan. Do you know where the center of the labyrinth is, Mary? Adam asked her. She had seemed to take more of a liking to him than to me. It wasn't uncommon as Adam was a very talkative, selfless, and gregarious person, while I was more of an introvert and a loner. To my surprise, Mary nodded yes to the question. A slim ray of hope entered my mind for the first time in what felt like forever. Adam's eyes sparkled too, as he was excited by the prospect of getting closer to escape. We are heading there now. She said while scooping out little bites of plain tuna fish with her disgusting fingers and forcing them into her mouth. There are less traps at the center, but no food or drink. That's why Daddy and I always stayed closer to the edge, where we could get long pork. She smiled at this. 
You mean people, I said, and Adam shot me a glance telling me to shut up. But Mary only smiled wider. Oh yes, otherwise I would have starved months ago. We have to stretch our food supplies here, but I grew to like the taste of long pork, especially when it was dried and cooked. It reminded me of jerky. She sat and licking her lips. Mary, how long have you been down here? Adam asked. Mary only shook her head. Uh, must have been years, she said frowning. Looking at her sickly emaciated frame, the rags that she wore that had once been clothing, the way that her shoes were falling apart, I thought she was probably right. And then we began to hear footsteps outside of the door. We all stopped speaking instantly. Adam and I grabbed our weapons and started standing, ready to fight. I motioned to Mary and Adam nodded, giving her the dagger back that we had stolen from her father. I wondered whether it was a smart move, seeing as she was clearly insane and might just stab us in the back to try to eat us, but I had a feeling that we didn't have much of a choice. An old quote ran through my mind. Misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. And I almost felt an urge to chuckle, thinking just how true that really was. Something slammed against the door, sending it flying open. Adam and I waited a moment, Mary behind us. We were out of view of the door, but standing next to the threshold so that, if somebody walked through, we could attack from the side as soon as they stepped a foot into the room. It was what ended up happening. As the surgeon in the mask had entered, a scalpel raised. I tried to bring my weapon down on his head, but he was amazingly fast, ducking at the final moment. The sword whistled harmlessly overhead. He stuck his scalpel into my leg, making me yell out in pain. But Adam took the moment of distraction to bring his mace smashing down on the surgeon. The surgeon's head erupted and bits and pieces of it flew into my mouth as well. I started wiping furiously at the coppery taste and my lips and I started spitting. The burning pain from my leg rose up and looking down, I saw rivulets of red soaking into my blue jeans. I hoped that it hadn't hit an artery. We need to go now. Mary hissed at us and we both nodded. I was significantly slowed down now, hobbling along beside them, but the pain wasn't as bad as I had expected. I figured it had been an extremely lucky shot to avoid crippling me or causing me to bleed out down here. Adam ripped off a piece of his t-shirt and made an impromptu bandage, tightening it with knots. We heard more footsteps behind us, and all three of us found huge stalagmites to hide behind peeking out in the subtle glow of the cave. We saw a few of the faceless humanoids pass us by, one wearing an expensive black suit, and the other two wearing hiking clothing and windbreakers. Their faceless heads seemed to ripple, expanding and contracting, as I wondered if it was a result of them breathing through their skin. I wondered just what they were in fact. Mary nodded at us to keep going forward and we did. I could hear shrieks ahead of us. Looking around a bend in the cave, I saw two middle-aged men trying to fight off the faceless monsters. One of them had a pistol. He raised it to the chest of one of them, blowing its heart out. The monster fell back, but another one grabbed him from behind. And the other living monster quickly knocked out the second man. And then the two monsters worked in tandem, one reaching out to the conscious man's chest, his fingers gently touching the fabric of the shirt, and then with unimaginable strength, he began to pull the man's skin and bones apart. The man shrieked, but the other monster had his arms pinned behind his back too tightly for him to fight back. Soon, they had his heart out of his chest and the man's head had slumped to the side. One of the monsters put it up to its blank head. The head appeared to split open in the middle, thousands of tiny black lamprey teeth showing for a moment as he ate the man's heart. They let the man's body fall to the side and the other monster repeated the process with the unconscious man, eating his heart as well. And then they continued forward, 
the only remaining sign of their passing being three bodies with massive holes in the chest. Mary, Adam, and I began to move forward again. Countless footsteps were now approaching from behind and we all began to run as fast as we could. Soon the cave system ended and we came out in an ancient oak forest. The two monsters were waiting for us there and Adam and I walked forward attacking. I quickly dispatched mine but the one attacking Adam was too quick. The monster had gotten behind Adam and was about to grab him by the neck when Mary had jumped in, stacking her dagger into the spot where the abomination's face should have been. It gave an ear-splitting shriek as its head opened up and it fell back. But the distraction had allowed dozens more monsters from the cages to reach the end of the cave. We all ran for our lives. This way, Mary said, panting, she took us down a small deer trail and we found an ancient stone cellar with a heavy door attached. We all got in and found that it had a latch to lock it from the inside. Adam stuck his mace through the latch just as a monster had approached from the outside, beginning to smash at it. I heard dozens of more footsteps from all around us, and I knew that we were surrounded. Well, this is it, I said sitting down and sighing. There's no getting out of this one. We can't fight off all of them out there. Mary sat down too, humming to herself, but I noticed that tears were now flowing down her face. Adam only grinned at me, taking his backpack off. Did you forget? Adam asked. I grabbed that book when we first got in here. I told you guys my instincts were screaming at me to take it. He pulled the large, ancient tome out with the title, the Angel of Death written on the front. Drops of blood constantly dropped out the front of it. The voice of Set began to vibrate and reverberate around us. Will you give your souls yet, friends? He asked. There's no need for all of you to die like sheep led to the slaughter. For I am the Good Shepherd, and I hate to see my sheep ripped apart by the wolves. He laughed at this. Adam ignored the voice coming from nowhere and everywhere and opened the door. The pages were blank at first, but then text written in blood began to appear. The book was upside down from my point of view, but Adam quickly read it, frowning. Mary, let me see the knife, Adam said, putting out his hand. Mary handed it over. According to the book, all I need to do is say a prayer and carve this name in my arm and this thing will come to us and save us all. The door to the stone cellar began to shake more violently, as more bodies seemed to show up by the minute. You better hurry up then, I said to him. We don't have much time until those things break through. Fools, the voice of Set screamed. You should not open that book. Do you wish to bring the Watcher to your world? The Watcher will kill the sun, destroy the moon, blot out every star. The Watcher does not care at all for your lives. He continued to ramble, but we all ignored it, and Adam began the ritual. The poem appeared in red on the pages, and he began to read it, holding the knife over his left arm. An old man dies, a newborn breeze, the bugs feast, the infection sees. Winter enters and never leaves. The lone dissenter lives and deceives. The angel of death arises again. The eternal cycle of a bloody rain. As he read the last stanza, he also cut the name Israel into his left arm, wincing for a moment as the sharp knife did its work. And then he held his arm above his head the blood trickling down, forming and reforming into large and larger rivulets, and then turned sharply and aimed directly at his heart. As soon as the first drop had reached the center of his chest, appearing to defy gravity as it rolled down and back up his chest, an amazing and horrible thing started to happen. Adam's eyes began to emanate a soft, glowing white light, and he began to float above the ground. Behind him, I saw dozens of visions of his floating body splitting off, as if I was looking into a mirror image reflected into another mirror image, 
The dozens kept going until it looked like hundreds, and then millions and then eternity, disappearing into a point at the horizon. Each of the bodies began to fade in and out and then eyes started to come into view, swarming and morphing all over these countless bodies. Soon I couldn't see anything that once had been Adam. His entire body was covered in soft, glowing white eyes that stared out in all directions at once. And then the billions of eyes on the eternal bodies all turned to me at once. And I felt an impending sense of terror and doom of an intensity that I had never imagined possible. Who calls on me? A soft voice said from everywhere and nowhere at once. It slightly shook the walls and floor. I tried to look away, but I couldn't. The eternal copies of Adam's body all collapsed into one in a single moment, and I was back to just staring at the spot where Adam's body had been. The endless hallway of mirror images disappearing instantly. Mary stood up, backing away to the very edge of the cellar. I knew that I had to answer even though all those staring eyes seemed to bring me to the brink of madness. We need your help, Azrael, I said. The angel laughed as the door began to splinter. I could see claws and hands reaching through, feeling around for what held it shut. One of them began to sneak close to the mace and shake it loose. Then why would I help you? He asked, the voice seeming to shake the ground with every syllable. Because, I said, pointing, Set has released those things to kill your host. And without a host, I have a feeling that you'll be going back to whatever otherworldly prison you came from. The eyes of the angel all turned towards the door as the mace fell out and the door swung open. Dozens of monsters began to pour in. The floating angel laughed at this, raising his arms. Huge thorns and spikes began to shoot out of the leaves and dirt, wrapping around each of the monsters and dragging them into the ground. Within seconds, their screams had all ceased. No one stood there. From behind me, I heard another deeper voice. Set's fiery eyes were embedded into the stone wall and he stepped out, his black poisonous body appearing at once. He and the angel of death stared at each other for a long moment. Mary grabbed my arm and we began to back out of the stone cellar. As we got to the threshold, Set raised one arm, and the ceiling began to collapse on Ezreal. Massive blocks of stone fell on his head, and within seconds he was buried. The cacophony of the collapsing structure made my ears ring, and Mary and I began to sprint blindly ahead. As I looked back, I saw the stones go flying up in the air, Ezreal floating up from the place where the stone cellar had stood. Set was also flying, glancing down at his enemy with hatred. Ezreal raised an ethereal hand, and a huge oak tree was ripped out of the ground and went flying in Set's direction. He easily blocked it, flying higher into the forest and letting it pass harmlessly underneath them. Up ahead, I saw a hatchway in the middle of the forest. It didn't look like it belonged, but I knew that we had to find somewhere to hide. As Set and Azrael fought, I ran up to it opening up and what I saw astonished me. I was looking down into the hatchway, but on the other side, I was looking up through the spot next to where Adam and I had parked my car. I looked back and saw Azrael and Set throwing fire and lava at each other, setting the forest alight around them. I nodded at Mary and she jumped through without hesitation, and then I followed. It was a disorienting experience, going down through the hatchway only to find myself crawling up out of a secret dirt door a few feet in front of my car. As soon as I was out, the door slammed shut behind me and it turned back into flat dirt. I looked around and saw that there was no longer a gas station there, just endless trees. I brought Mary to the hospital and then I went home, wrapping up my own wounds with a first aid kit. I didn't know what to do about Adam. After washing and sleeping, I decided to go to the police station the next day and report Adam missing. I told them that I had brought him home from work, but that I hadn't been able to get in contact with him since then. 
They ignored my report, saying that if he still hadn't shown up in a couple more days, then I should come back. I have a feeling that I will likely never see him again. His sacrifice allowed Mary and me to escape that horrid place, however. I hope that he's still alive somewhere, and that maybe he will find a way out, just like we did. But whenever I sleep now, I hear Adam screaming. In my dreams, he always has pure white irises and pupils, and he always looks around with terror, asking where he is. Behind him, I see an eternal sky covered in ethereal, glowing eyes. Life is scary when you quit your job and literally nobody noticed. Life is scary when you wink at your crush as you pass by your desk, only to realize that you have toilet paper stuck to your heel. Life is even scary when it's your first date and you really need to fart. Now we all deal with Sunday scaries, right? That oh crap, a stressful, nervous, can't sleep, dread feelings that hit you on Sunday evenings when you think about work or school the next day, or life in general. Unfortunately, you can feel that same pit in your stomach any day of the week. Sunday scary CBD gummies were made to defeat the crap life throws at us. These are the perfect CBD gummies for professionals on the grind. Super moms, students, party animals, regretful drunk texters, and everything in between. Now me personally, I don't relax very well. I've never been someone who can just sit down and chill out. I always feel like I need to be doing something. Whether that is work-wise or at home. It's just hard to shut off my brain and chill. While that can be positive in some ways, it also makes me overthink and stress myself out. Sunday Scaries are vitamin-boosted CBD gummies that actually work and they chill me out fast. Look, we all have the right to live scare-free. So whether you need to take the edge off, calm your racing mind, or sleep better, or just chill. Take two CBD gummies. Every day to keep the scaries away. Let me save you with my 25% discount. Visit sundayscaries.com and use my promo code MrCreeps for your discount. That's sundayscaries.com promo code MrCreeps for 25% off. I was from the city. I had dreams of escaping the busy day-to-day -day shuffles of it all and always dreamed of living in a small town away from everything. After months of hunting and arguing with realtors, I found some property that I wanted to call my own and start a new life with my son. It was a small farming town in Kansas with a population of around 2,000 people. It was perfect. I bought the land, packed me and my son Elijah's things in a U-Haul, and we made our journey to our new home. Looking back on it, he was more excited about it than I was, and I was pretty excited myself. Me and my son's escape from everything and to start a fresh new chapter in our new lives. My son was just coming up on nine years old. His new school was close to our new farm and he didn't have many friends in the city, so I knew the move was going to be good for him. His mother, my wife, had passed away when he was at an early age due to an illness, so I was filling in as both parents. He was a pretty happy kid though, always energetic and curious just like his mother was. The farm that I bought was called Crow's Rest. It was a couple of acres filled with a sweet corn that was already taller than me. A lot of it was ready to harvest too, and I was excited to get started in our new venture. When I saw the layout online, I could only think, it's perfect. It wasn't too big and not too small either. The two-story house on the property looked like it wasn't in bad shape either too, like somebody had recently fixed it up. The bank said that the last owners had just abandoned it out of nowhere, and I was able to get it for a steal. They said that it's common for people to get overwhelmed by the high maintenance that it takes to run a farm. I knew that I was ready though. 
After hours of driving across the states, we had finally arrived at our new home. It was about noon when we had arrived at Crow's Rest for the first time. The way the fields and the house brightened in the countryside sunlight, it was beautiful. Elijah could barely contain himself in the passenger seat when we had pulled up, quickly pulling on the door handle, yelling and screaming out in excitement. I was happy that he liked it. Again, seeing him happy was worth it all to me. I parked the car and he was already in the fields, running down the walking path, wowing at it all. I also started making my way into the path so I could finally scope it all out in person. One thing the photos didn't show was the number of crows on the property. It was overwhelming. They did forewarn me that it wasn't just a name. Crows did seem to gather here a lot, but there were double the amount than what they had showed in the property photos. I didn't let it get to me though. It was the least of our issues. I knew there would be a couple things that they would try to sneak past us. Dad, look over here. I heard Elijah yell in excitement. I made my way over to him to see what he was so excited about and what he was staring at. It was a scarecrow. I walked up next to Elijah and he was so excited to see it. It was positioned on this tall wooden cross that hung over all the cornfields. Its arms were wrapped around the sides like it was nailed on to look like we were standing there, with its hands grasping the sides on the cross. I remember I thought then that it looked eerie to say the least. On our bright and happy new farm, this scarecrow was like a dark figure in it all, and it wasn't doing the best at its job, as crows rested on the cross with it and on top of its shoulders. As I looked closely at its face, all I saw were stitches of eyes and a mouth with hay sticking out with a noose and necktie around its neck to hold its potato sack head. I look around its body. It wore handmade clothes with little gaps of hay sticking out through the holes. The clothes were like farmer's clothes, but they were all darker shades from being dirty and worn. It wore a dark black trench coat that was worn out and ripped up near the bottom. It wore black boots, much like farm workers wear with a toe box that looked like it had seen better days. And lastly, a dark sun hat on its head as the finishing touch. It felt like it didn't fit in with the rest of the farm, but Elijah seemed to love him. Can I name him dad? Please, please, he said with excitement. I didn't want to ruin his happiness with how off-putting the thing made me feel. What the heck, I thought. If he enjoyed it, I figured that I would suffer with the eyesore for him. Yeah, go ahead, name him whatever you want. Elijah thought on it for a bit. He looked around the farm and did all the crows and then back at the scarecrow. Tobias. Traitor to all crow kind, he said with such an innocence in his voice. Honestly, giving it a name like that made it seem more or less eerie, weirdly enough. Well, Tobias it is then. With an arm around him, I said, Come on, let's go get things unpacked and check out the new place, I said, directing him back toward the direction of the car crows calling all around us as we made our way back. The first couple of weeks were great. I started getting a handle on the whole farm life, got all the equipment and the tools that we needed, some minor fix-ups around the house and the barn, and even told Elijah soon that we could start picking out some animals. We even made our way into town, getting to know a lot of the locals. Many of them had never even heard of Crow's Rest when I had brought it up, which was strange to me with how close to town it was. 
They were excited about the corn that I was promising everyone now. Everything was perfect until it all started happening all at once. I was working on the barn out back, on the opposite side of the crops, away from the house. I was giving it a fresh coat of paint that it desperately needed. When I heard Elijah in the fields, it was like he was talking to someone. Curious about it all, I yelled out to him. Hey, who are you talking to, buddy? It was quiet for a bit and I got worried. So I dropped my brushes and walked over to where the walkway that went through the field. Elijah. I said again and then he popped out from the crops. Looking at me like he did something wrong and he was scared to be in trouble. I tried to see what was the matter. What's up, buddy? Who are you talking to out there? The birds. I said jokingly, but he had a nervous look on his face. I was talking to Tobias, he said, still nervously. I didn't think much of it, so I added to it. Oh yeah, what did Tobias have to say? Is he ready for some new clothes because his aren't looking so pleasant nowadays? I continued joking. As I was whipping some paint that got on my hands of my pants, and started walking back towards the barn side. Tobias doesn't talk much, he just listens. He waved at me so I waved back at him and asked how he was, Elijah said. And waved at him. It must have been the crow's movement and he got it confused. Still, I didn't want him to think that it could move. I don't think Tobias can move, buddy. He is made of straw after all. But Elijah interrupted me before I could finish. He does move, Dad. I've seen it. He yelled out at me. I had no idea what he was talking about or how even to respond back to it. Are you sure about that one, buddy? When did you see such a thing? Or have I been missing something? I said, clearly arguing with my nine-year-old about if a scarecrow had moved or not. Well, he waved at me, and he leaves his cross at night. I see him moving around the field sometimes, and last night he was standing in front of our house. My heart stopped. What did he just say? The other stuff I could let go to was wild imagination, but if he saw somebody standing in front of our house, that's when it started to become alarming for me. Wait... You saw somebody stand in front of our house last night, and you see people moving out in the fields. Why haven't you told me about any of this until now? Elijah looked nervous like he was in trouble for not mentioning it any sooner, but this was concerning. I tried to level with him on it. Hey, you're not in trouble, but things like this, I gotta know about them, buddy. We can't have people running around our property. It's not safe. I tried reassuring him if someone was stalking around the farm at night. I wanted to know about it. I'm glad that he told me now so that I can keep an eye out for it. It's not people though, Dad. It's Tobias. Again, he tries to tell me that it's the Scarecrow, which in reality was probably better that he thought that than it being a person. I didn't want to argue with him and upset him, so I dropped it for now. Okay, let's call it a day and get some dinner ready. I put my arm around him, looking around our fields as we started to head back to the house. Looking at Tobias hanging there before heading out of the fields. That night after dinner, I put Elijah to bed and was on my computer working for a bit. I still worked from home remote even though we were doing the farm now, just to make sure that we had some cash flow still, and I would stay up at night finishing the work pretty late, usually till about midnight. That night I kept thinking about what Elijah had said about people in our fields. It concerned me so, 
I figured that I would report it to the local authorities in the morning just to have it documented. It was probably just some local kids playing in our fields, if anything. But then I heard something outside. It sounded like slow, trotting footsteps right outside on the other side of the wall that I was sitting. I froze. There really was someone outside. What should I do? I remember thinking. I didn't even own a gun yet. Honestly, I didn't even think that I would need one. I slowly started to get up out of my chair and quickly made it over to the lamp to turn out the lights. I wanted to make the room as dark as possible, so I could maybe sneak a peek out the window to see what it was before it could see me. I heard the slow walking thud of whatever it was still, but it wasn't in the vision of the window corner that I was peeking out of yet. I could feel my heart pounding, nervously waiting to see whatever was just freely walking our property, hoping that it was just some animal. And then I heard something very quietly. I heard words. You're not real. Follow my voice. I can help you. It's just a story. Lost in the, the dark all alone. L let me in. It's here. Let me in. It was like broken sentences with long pauses in between them. It said these things with a rustic, whispering-like voice. No doubt about it now, someone was outside just freely walking our property. Hearing the voices only made me angrier, honestly. I refused to let somebody just freely walk our property. I finally gathered the courage up grabbing a baseball bat that I had downstairs and I started to make it to the front door. I swung it open and ran to the side of the house facing the fields where I swore that I heard the footsteps. I saw nothing. All I could hear now was the wind blowing and the crops swaying back and forth. I was so confused. I know that I heard something. The night sky was clear so I could see around me, but not well enough to look for people's footprints. I didn't know what to do. And then suddenly, a loud crashing started, like something was knocking over plates, photo frames off the walls, and even the chairs. It was inside my house, whatever it is. It was inside my house. It had to have snuck through the front door when I came outside. My heart dropped. How could I be so careless? Oh my god, Elijah, I panicked. I quickly bolted back to the front of the house, going through the front door. It looked like somebody had let a rampaging bull into our home. Everything was knocked over and smashed on the ground. Glass was shattered all over the kitchen floor. I was trying to move around to avoid stepping on any glass, but I started hearing that rustic voice again, only this time it was yelling violently, screeching more words throughout my house. Down the lane, through the field, I hear crows, don't open your eyes. I made it past the kitchen, scrabbling to make it to the stairway as fast as I could. Whatever this thing was, it was upstairs, rampaging around. I had to get to Elijah as quickly as I could. It continued to scream things upstairs as it was moving around like it was looking for something. Olivia, hide. It's coming, Olivia. You're not real, monster. Help me open up. Keep running. It won't die. Everything that it was saying didn't make sense, like fragments of sentences, but every word held weight to them. Its voice was terrifying, whatever it was. I knew that it couldn't be human after hearing it scream. I made it to the top of the steps, hearing a blood-curdling scream from Elijah in his room. Daddy, help! It's gonna get me! 
he said in a tone that had pure terror behind every word. I push off into the hallway and the sides of the walls have holes and claw marks all up the sides like something was pulling its way through the walkway. The door to his room was ripped off and hanging against the wall in the hallway. A loud crash like broken glass came from his room. I finally turned into his room to see no one there. I looked around in a frenzied panic. His room was destroyed like it ran around fighting to grab him. I screamed out for him. Elijah, where are you? I heard him scream again. And I noticed Elijah's window was broken open like something had him, busted through it and had jumped out. I rushed over and looked out. Broken glass in the ground below and then I saw him. Something dragging my son from behind into the fields as he continued to scream out for me. Disappearing into the field, only able to see the corn parting from above as they moved deeper into the thick of it. I turned around, making it back downstairs and outside, bolting in the direction of the fields where he was getting dragged off to. Every chance that I could, I screamed out for him more. Elijah's screams echoed through the night as it dragged him through the cornfields. My baby boy, begging for his daddy's help as it pulled him deeper into the fields with its rustic, screeching howl through the night. I was helpless to protect him, unable to do anything for him. I couldn't match its speed. It moved so fluently through the field as the crows above blanketed the skies like they were its servants, watching me helplessly trail behind them, squawking and screaming at me as I pushed past the tall corn stalks trying to keep close. Elijah's faint screaming led me toward where it was taking him. I felt so helpless. Tears started to river down my face. I had lost his mother and now I was going to lose my boy. I swore that I would look after him, honey. His screams eventually stopped, but I continued mine hoping to hear back from him and to let him know that daddy was coming. I pushed past out of the field into one of our path clearings in between the crops. There he was. Elijah was lying there. He was cut up, but he looked okay. Relief started to overtake me. I started to run towards him. Once in my embrace, nothing would take him from me. He was lying on his side, slowly getting up like whatever had dropped him and gone deeper into the crops. He looked up at me, crying and terrified. He screamed, Dad, help me. Get me out of here, please. He started to stand now. I'm so scared. While tears were streaming down his face, I'm coming, buddy. It's gonna be okay. You're safe now. As I got closer to him, I felt better as I was about to scoop him up in my arms and get him out of there, away from whatever place this was. Right when I got close enough, what looked like eight silhouettes of hands reached out from the crops, grabbing onto him violently before I could, plunging him into the fields dragging him across the ground back into the thickness of the cornstalk again. He instantly screamed out to me with his surprise shock. Only this time, our eyes were locked together as he got dragged into the crop. Elijah, no! Grab my hand! I screamed out, as all the hopeful feelings I felt being so close to him got ripped again right in front of my eyes. I followed behind him, reaching out to try and grab his hand, but it wasn't enough with every attempt failing, just barely missing his touch. And then the thick of the corn stalk was no more. The area was all laid down like it was a small crop circle. The sky above was nearly blacked out from the swarm of swirling crows overhead, but I could finally see the thing that was taking my son and the bit of moonlight that had peeked through. It was Tobias. The scarecrow was alive. Elijah was right. 
I felt ineffable fear as I watched this thing. I leaned back as its chest was ripped open, with what I can only describe as shadows coming from it. Formulating what looked like over 20 silhouettes of hands grabbing and wrapping around Elijah. Some fled around frantically, moving so inhuman, grasping at the air and some grabbing at the ground, while the other half wrapped around Elijah. One of the hands now reached out, covering his mouth as it muffled his screams. I didn't know what to do as it screamed out another rustic saying, Tobias can't move, he's made of, of straw. With tears streaming down his face, Elijah held out his hand toward me. The hand slowly wrapped and warped around him, pulling him into the eternal void of its chest. He slowly disappeared inside the void in its chest until only his arm was hanging out, eventually being fully pulled in. After consuming him, all the hands went back inside it. Its chest had started sewing itself back up as it leaned forward and now hunched over. I was in a coma of fear as I watched it. I couldn't move a single muscle in my body. The only noise now was the crows overhead squawking and flying in a circle above us. The scarecrow twitched every couple of seconds. It slowly began to move again, looking up toward me, staring into my soul with its sewn-together face. It said one final thing that night. It's just a scarecrow. Don't be afraid. There was calm stillness after that and then it let out another rustic scream that pierced through the night sky, sending all the crows flying in different directions. I couldn't fight this thing. This had to be some embodiment of a living nightmare. Adrenaline pumping through me, I bolt backward, out of the clearing onto the trail heading back to the house. It pushed out of the crops, falling over it, as it chased in the direction that I was running quickly recovering and crawling after me on all fours like it was some animal. I looked back at it. The silhouettes of all the hands had returned, flailing around its body. They moved like snakes in different directions, frantically around its body. It used them to grab the ground and move faster toward me, screaming its rustic howl as it chased after me. I turned the corner where the barn was, and the final pathway stretched to the front of the house and the truck. It was toying with me, screaming from behind me, still howling its rustic screech into the night sky as it crawled behind me. It's like it wanted me to feel hopeful like I could escape before it took me, like before when it took. I just kept running. I made it back to the front of the house and headed to my truck. I kept a spare key inside of it and left it unlocked that night, thank God. I jumped in, locked it, and turned it on. The headlights flashed in front of me, but I didn't see anything. I quickly put it in reverse, and I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. My heart was pounding and tears rolled down my face. I was unable to protect him, feeling like I should have done more, but facing this thing felt like a death wish. I just wanted my son back. As soon as I started to back up, it landed on the front of my truck, smashing the windshield on its landing. Its serpent-like silhouetted arms were now wrapped around the front of the truck. Its face was inches away from mine, the cracked windshield being the only barrier between us. It's like it was looking deep inside my soul with its demonic sewn-together eyes. It let out another scream, its mouth pulling down as the stitched sewing was holding it. The scream was so powerful that it looked like it was about to rip the stitching. I quickly put the truck back in drive and I floored it, moving towards the cornfield and slamming onto the brakes. The creature flew off the front of the truck from the forest and it fell to the ground. I watched it scramble on the ground and look back up at me. 
It tilted its head and it started to lunge toward the truck again. But then I floored it, running over it with my truck. As I did, I heard its rustic cries ring out into the night. I quickly put my car in reverse and ran back over it. Again, it cried out a high-pitched screech. I started yelling back at it now, feeling like I was hurting it like it hurt me. I repeated this motion over and over again. I wanted to destroy it for ripping everything from me. Finally, I had reversed enough to have my headlights as a spotlight on it as it lay there. I didn't want to leave, but I rolled over it so many times. Eventually, I drove to the sheriff's station as fast as I could to report everything that had happened. When we had returned to the scene, the scarecrow wasn't there. They didn't believe anything that I said about what had happened that night either. I mean, how could you blame them? Everything that had unfolded sounded like a bad dream. They saw the state of the house and asked me again if there were some details that I may have been missing out on. They even questioned me and I'm still under investigation, thinking that I played some part in this. They themselves said a lot was unexplainable, but the case is still open to this day on my son's disappearance. I still hear its rustic voice mimicking my words in my head at night. I know what I saw and what took him, and it's still out there. It was a long and lonely road, straight as a weed stalk and dry like you wouldn't believe. My car sat idling on the yellow line, burping out exhaust as the sun lay bleeding on the horizon. I had come a long way with further yet to go, but something in me, something itchy and unnerving said that it was time to stop. I looked at the words glowing on my phone. It was a prompt for some writer's group or something. It sounds like something King would write, I thought, and we all know what a hack he's become. I wish I could churn out trash like he does and make millions from it but I'm no writer. I'm clean up on aisle 15 Blared over the radio clipped to my hip. I knew that it was my turn, but still, I glanced around the break room for anyone that I could get to do it for me. Unfortunately, there was no one. While I had been zoned out, staring at my phone like a zombie, everybody else had finished their break and left, which meant that I had something to look forward to after cleaning up some customer's mess. A butt chewing from my crew leader, Amy. I left the break room and headed for the supply room to get my mop and bucket. ILA 15 was on the other side of the store, so I knew that it wouldn't be long until... Clean up on ILA 15. The radio blared more forcefully. I ripped it off my belt, thinking of all the things that I would like to say in response but I swallowed my pride and said, in route. When I got there, Amy was standing beside a puddle of something brown and liquid that I didn't want to identify. She had her arms folded across her chest and was tapping her toe. Did you finally finish your break? She said with no hint of actual interest. Yes, ma'am. I said pulling my bucket next to the puddle and slopping water onto it. Watch it, she said as some of the water mixed with the brown liquid and splashed onto her shoes. I'm so sorry, I said, not meaning a word of it. Her face turned to fire engine red and looked like it was about to explode. You're fired, she squealed. I found it odd that such a large woman would have such a high voice when angry. You can't fire me, I said leaning on my mop. You're only a crew leader, not a member of management. She opened her mouth to say something, and then closed it as her face turned an even deeper shade of red. We'll see, she sputtered, and then turned to storm off nearly falling, slipping on her wet shoe. She recovered and continued storming away, as I did everything I could not to burst into tears laughing. 
I finished my odious chore and took the bucket back to the supply room to empty and rinse it. I had to rinse the bucket a few times to get the stench out. I smiled, thinking about Amy trying to get it out of her shoe. By the time that I was done, I stepped out of the store with half the lights off. I breathed a sigh of relief. My shift overlapped with Amy's shift. We would come in in a few hours before the store had closed and once it did, we were free to go do our restocking and cleaning duties. The first hour was usually spent dodging cashiers as they took their trays to count. After they left, we locked the doors and it was only myself, Sam, and Greg in the massive and empty store. I won't lie, there were many times that my imagination got the best of me as I roamed the empty aisles of the half-lit store, and the three of us had played pranks on each other. But tonight wasn't starting out like that. Sam wasn't feeling good and was already talking about going home early. Greg was in his zone with his earbuds in, listening to creepy pastas as he stocked the shelves. I had just pulled my third skit out of the stock room when something had darted in front of me. I stopped so quickly that the pallet's forward momentum pushed me, nearly knocking me over. Very funny, guys, I said into my radio. You can knock it off now. What are you talking about? Sam said. Whoever's hiding by the stock room doors can come out now. I'm not falling for it. I'm over in hardware and Greg is a few aisles down from me in automotive, Sam said. Yeah, sure you are, I said. I look over towards hardware, Sam said. As I did, I saw a beam of light flash up toward the dark part of the ceiling. Uh, did you see my light? Yeah, I did, I said slowly, suddenly not wanting to turn the corner toward where whatever it was that had just disappeared. What did you see? Sam said. That must have been my imagination. I said trying to convince myself as much as him. Okay, you good. Yeah, no problem. I pulled my pallet jack forward slowly and peeked around the corner. Nothing was there except a seemingly endless aisle of shelves. I shook myself mentally for allowing myself to get spooked so easily and then I pulled my pallet jack down the aisle past toys and into housewares. I forced myself to stare straight ahead and not glance down the aisles as I passed them. As I passed the last toy aisle, my pallet truck seemed to get heavier. It was as if one of the wheels was stuck on something. I stopped and went around the back to check the wheels. There sitting in the middle of the floor was a large stuffed bear that was around three feet high. Where did you come from, little guy? I said. I didn't think that it had been on my pallet, but I sat it on top to take to the display near the front of the store. As I made the turn towards the main aisle, I passed Sam heading back with an empty pallet. Looks like I found a passenger, I said with a smile. Who's that? Sam said. The little guy on top, I said turning and pointing at the bear except the bear was gone. What passenger? Sam said. Oh, he must have fallen off. I made you look, I said. Sam gave me an odd look and then a half-hearted chuckle. Good one, he said, pulling his empty pallet back towards the stock room. Once he was out of sight, I looked around for the bear, but it was nowhere to be found. I shrugged. Maybe it did just fall off. I pulled my pallet down the aisle towards a central spot where most of my merchandise was displayed. I pulled out my box cutter and sliced the plastic wrap open, and then started the boring task of stocking the shelves. I found myself envious of Greg having earbuds to listen to something. I would have to invest in some of my hard-earned minimum wage money in a set to make the job less boring. As I loaded merchandise on the shelves, I heard it sound like something had fallen off a shelf. At first, I thought that Greg had dropped something, but then it hit me. I hadn't seen Greg's pallet truck in the main aisle. I stepped up and looked up and down the main aisle. Nothing was there. 
Come to think of it, I hadn't heard Sam come back through with his next load either. Usually they load the pallets by section, so we work through the store methodically. I guess Sam's load was the exception. I went back to stocking shelves with an odd feeling in the back of my head. For some reason, I couldn't shake it. I felt very alone tonight. I wondered if somebody was planning a prank on me. I really didn't mind. It helped the night go faster. I eventually finished my pallet and decided to go back to the stock room the long way and find the other guys. If they were planning something, maybe I could catch them in the act. I was halfway around to the front of the store when I saw a pallet that was only half empty. I looked around, but I didn't see anyone. I shrugged it off and went past when I noticed drops of red on the white floor. They led from the pallet down another aisle. I followed the trail only to find a massive puddle of red and Greg laying motionless in the middle of it. For a split second, I froze. Panic gripped me until I remembered who was laying there. This was the guy who set up a costume that made it look like he had been decapitated last Halloween, complete with the fake spraying blood. I remember how angry Amy had been when she had sprayed her. It was the best Halloween ever. Her threatening to fire us was just the icing on the cake. Yeah, have fun cleaning that up. I said as I turned away from the still body and went back to my pallet. I stared it around the mess so I wouldn't spread it any further. He better clean that up, I thought, before it stains the floor. That might actually get him fired if Amy finds out. On my way back to the stock room, I heard footsteps. They weren't loud, but I could tell that somebody was trying to sneak up on me, but they were being quiet about it. I could just envision Greg tiptoeing behind me to jump out of an aisle covered in fake blood and scare me. That would be so awesome if I was watching it happen to somebody else, but I was a little annoyed. Greg's little prank was getting us further behind in our stocking chores, which meant further behind in our cleaning chores. Not to mention that he had made a huge mess and I wasn't cleaning that up, even though the front was my assigned section for the night. I had had enough. I stopped my pallet truck and whipped around only to catch a glimpse of someone dodging behind a rack of clothes. All right, Greg, I said. You got me. I'm so scared out of my mind right now. I looked at the floor and there was a faint line of red footprints, but they had faded like somebody had followed for a while and the red was wearing off with every step they took. Are you kidding me right now? I said. I'm done with this little prank. You're cleaning all those footprints up. I turned and dragged my pallet truck off at exasperated speed. Children, I mumbled angrily. I work with children. I reached the stock room and kicked the doors open, making them smack against the wall loudly. I don't care. Maybe Greg will get it that I'm pissed and knock this crap off. I drove my pallet truck into the next pallet, but it wouldn't go. I looked and there was already a pallet truck that had picked up this load from the other side. I stepped around to find Sam, laying on the floor in a puddle of red liquid. Come on, you two. Enough of this. We need to get our work done. I reached down and grabbed his arm, but his body didn't move. I pulled his head up out of the puddle and then let it go. It fell with a heavy thunk. A cold wave crept over me as my shaking hand pressed against my neck and waited to feel a pulse. A minute later, I pulled my hand away without feeling anything. I licked at the red liquid on my hand and I recoiled. Out of the corner of my eye, something had caught my attention. It was the stuffed bear sitting on the floor just outside of the pool of blood. There were dark spots on its fur that I hadn't seen before and laying on the floor beside it was a large butcher's knife. My mind refused to believe what I was seeing. I knew that it was impossible, and yet there lay my dead friend in his own blood as proof. Someone who had to have staged this, it couldn't be real. As those thoughts chased each other around my mind, the impossible happened. The bear's head moved. 
It turned and looked right at me, and then its eyes began to glow red. It was like somebody had turned on a set of red LEDs, but I knew that, that was impossible. These bears were just stuffed. We sold them all the time, and I'd never seen one with lights in it. And came the next impossibility. It stood. The bottoms of its feet were round, so it wobbled a little trying to gain its balance. And then it leaned over and picked up the knife. Its hands were just stitched at the end of the arms to give it the appearance of a palm and fingers. When I picked up the knife, the fur wrapped around the handle and it lifted it. It was like watching somebody pick it up with a sock puppet on their hand. I watched in morbid fascination as this thing looked from the knife to me. My mind was screaming at me to get up, to do anything other than just sit there and wait for this monster with an innocent smiling face to end my life horribly like it had done to my friends. I patted my pockets looking for anything useful to defend myself. All I came up with was a handful of change and my box cutter. I pushed the blade out as far as it would go, one whole inch. As defensive weapons went, it sucked, especially against a murderous, psychotic stuffed bear holding a butcher knife. I can honestly say that's one thought that I never in my life could have anticipated thinking. My mind snapped me out of my reverie by reminding me of the seriousness of the situation. I jumped up, slipping and nearly falling on the floor, before gaining my balance and holding the box cutter out in front of me. It paused as if noting the ludicrousness of my actions, and then it charged at me slashing with the knife. I dodged, backpedaling as it charged. Each slash came closer to slicing one of my legs. I reached the end of the hallway and bolted through the stockroom doors, and as I did I felt pain in my right leg, but I didn't stop to examine it. I ran as fast as I could away from the stockroom. It wasn't until I was on the far side of the store that I paused to look at my injury. Blood was pouring from my leg and it had left an easy trail to follow. I looked up at the sign that said, Health and Beauty Aids with an arrow hopefully pointing the way to the section that was on the other side of the store, a good hundred yards away. I opened a roll of paper towels off the shelf and wrapped my leg in an impromptu bandage until I could get the proper supplies. As I finished, I saw a little brown head peek around the corner a dozen yards away. In any other circumstance, I might have been almost cute but in this one I knew that it was deadly. In running to the far side of the store, I unintentionally trapped myself in the corner. I looked around for anything that I could use to defend myself. I grabbed a mop from the shelf and swung it at the bear, knocking it off its feet. Unfortunately, it rolled with it and it was standing again before I had finished my swing. It dove at me, knife outstretched, but I managed to hit it with the mop before it stabbed me. I didn't wait around to celebrate. I ran toward health and beauty aids. And when I got there, I quickly found the bandage that I needed and I ran to another part of the store. I was sucking wind and had a stitch in my side and there was no way that I could keep up this pace. Eventually, it would wear me down to the point where I couldn't evade it and that I was done. I needed to hide until I could figure out a plan. The offices seemed the best place, but they were a dead end. If I hid there, I'd be trapped for sure. There was nowhere else that I could hide that it couldn't get to me except for maybe the freezer. But what would be the use of hiding from the thing and freezing to death in the process of it all? I needed to get out. And Greg was the one who had locked up, but I didn't know if he kept the keys with him or put them back in the office. There was only one way to find out, and it was near the front of the store. I glanced around and noticed the sporting goods section. Checking all around for the stuffed bear of death, I went to sporting goods and picked out a nice baseball bat. Now, at least I would have a sporting chance. I pulled a 10-speed bike off the rack and I mounted it as the furball came around the corner. I took off down the aisle, smacking its head with my bat as I passed. I glanced back to see it jump up and race after me. I shook my head and turned back around just in time to avoid running into a display. 
I pedaled harder to put some distance between me and Ed. And Greg's body was coming up fast and I knew that I didn't have much time. I slid the bike to a stop, rolled his body over and searched his pocket for the keys. I started to panic when I came up empty. I searched the other pocket and hit pay dirt at the same time that the knife hit me. I dove away from the attack, my shoulder screaming in pain, and I swung the bat at it. I connected with the knife and I knocked it away. The bear jumped on me and started swinging, showering me with lefts and rights of stunning veracity. Surprisingly, there wasn't much impact. It felt like I was being pummeled by pillows. It seemed to sense that I was being hurt and it jumped off me to retrieve the knife. I took the opportunity to hop on my bike and head for the door. Unfortunately, the tire had gotten some blood on it and I only made it a short distance before losing control and tumbling into a soda display. Bottles of soda falling at me hurt, but not as much as the time that I was losing until the monster caught up with me again. I stumbled to my feet, slipping over one last bottle before running toward the door with the monster close behind. I got to the door and I shoved the key in the lock, nearly snapping it off trying to turn it quickly. I prayed the, please help me, I'll never do anything bad again prayer as I struggled to open the doors with the monster bearing down on me, wielding its newly found knife. I slipped through and then turned my attention to closing the doors behind me. They were almost back together when it had arrived. It slashed the knife through the thin opening, just missing my leg as it tried to keep me from locking the door. The key turned most of the way and then it stopped. I struggled to close the door the last fraction of an inch as the monster continued to slash at me. It wasn't working. As long as the knife was keeping the doors from closing all the way, I couldn't lock them. I devised a brilliantly foolish plan. I shoved the doors open, surprising it for an instant, then lashed out, grabbing the handle of the knife and kicking the monster at the same time. It went reeling and I held the knife as it lost its grip. I stared at the knife for a second and then threw it down and closed the doors as the monster jumped up and charged. I was able to get them closed and locked before it could do anything to stop me. I leaned my forehead against the glass as the furball glared up at me, pounding on the door in impotent rage. The glass easily withstood the assault. I knelt down and stared into those glowing red eyes. Even now in relative safety, I wondered what this thing was and why it had done this. It stopped beating on the door long enough to return my gaze. It was hypnotic. I found myself staring blankly into the glowing red. After a minute, I shook myself, unlocked the outside door and stepped out into the cool night air. I took a deep breath, feeling safer than I had but also having my world seem a little more frightening knowing that such things existed and that nobody would believe me. I checked my injuries as I limped over to the employee section of the parking lot which was, of course, the farthest away from the store. As I opened my car, I noticed there were three other cars still parked there. Sam and Greg's cars would be hauled out eventually. I mourned the loss of my friends and wondered if I would be blamed for their deaths. At the moment, I was too tired to care about the future further than going home and going to bed. I didn't even think about calling the cops. One last night's sleep in my bed was all that I wanted. And then my eyes fell on a third car. It was Amy's. She should have been gone hours ago and yet here she was sitting in her car. I limped up to see if everything was okay. But the closer I got, I could see that she had her eyes closed but her mouth was moving. I could hear a soft murmur like she was humming a tune or something. I tapped on the window and her eyes shot open so quickly that I took a half step back. She looked at me and her face turned from calm to sheer terror. She started her car and sped out of the parking lot, nearly running over my foot in the process. I thought about her odd behavior as I collapsed into my car and started the engine. I drove in front of the store and looked in through the doors to find the bear laying down in front of them. 
I stopped the car and got out. I opened both doors and went in to look at the bear. I poked it with my foot and it didn't move. I rolled it over and I looked into its eyes. They were brown. In fact, the only reminder of the horror that this thing had inflicted was the dark spots of its fur. My mind started adding up all the things that led to the impossible. It couldn't be real. But then after everything else that went on tonight, I was pretty low on skepticism. I picked up the knife and I stuck it in my waistband. And then I reached for the bear slowly and cautiously. I lifted it, watching its eyes for any hint of red. And then I carried it out and put it in the trunk of my car. I pulled out my phone and looked up Amy's address and I drove to her house. I parked across the street where I wouldn't be noticed and I got out. I looked up and down the street and saw no one moving. Checking my watch, it was 2.30 in the morning. I opened the trunk and I lifted the bear, noticing the eyes had just a hint of red. I carried it across the street and up to the front door. By the time that I got there, the eyes had gotten brighter and I could feel it starting to move. I quickly shoved it in between the storm door and the main door. I threw the knife in with it and then shut the storm door, rang the doorbell and ran to my car. I got inside and slunk down just enough to be able to see when the porch light came on. I saw the inside door open, and that's when the screams began. I listened for a few minutes, feeling justified as well as horrified until they had stopped. I stared at the long straight road ahead, lit up like a runway, and wondered what would happen next. Something in me, something unnerving told me that I would never stop running. Can't sleep, waking up screaming. It might be the nightmares or maybe you're just on the wrong mattress. Ghost Bed is here to change that. For the last 20 plus years, the team behind Ghost Bed has been designing comfortable mattresses that are built to last. And they are the experts when it comes to pairing customers with the right mattress. Based on things like sleeping position, lifestyle, and more. Go to ghostbed.com today and take their online quiz to get your personalized recommendation within minutes. Want to talk to a real person instead? Ghostbed sleep experts can dive deeper into your needs and help you find the right match one-on-one. -on -one. Orders ship free and fast and you also get a 101 night sleep trial to make sure your mattress is the right fit for you. Also, if you're interested in bundling products, they're currently 50% off on site. Otherwise, use my specific code, Mr. Creeps, for 40% off site-wide. Again, visit ghostbed.com slash creepscast and use promo code Mr. Creeps at checkout to get 40% off mattresses plus get two luxury pillows and other freebies. That's www.ghostbed.com slash creepscast with promo code Mr. Creeps. I started spending time at the necropolis when my wife had left me. I had thought that we were doing fine. The passion of our younger days had burned itself out, but wasn't that what happened in all marriages? And then, in a short, one-sided conversation, I learned that she couldn't be with me anymore. That she was frustrated and angry and felt at times like she was suffocating. She told me this in the morning and by early evening, she was gone. Over the days that followed, the house that we had shared felt cold and empty, and I started to spend more time and more time away from it. I sat in cafes, nursing a coffee for hours. I paced the streets, and I discovered the necropolis. It was on the eastern outskirts of my home city, not an area that I had ever had a reason to go to before. As I stood there that first time, looking around at the thousands of burial places, I thought sadly how this city of the dead was a relic, abandoned long ago to fall into disarray. The headstones of the graves that lay all around me were darkened and worn with age. 
Some were broken and lay in pieces on the ground with weeds growing all around. I spent hours wandering in between them looking at the inscriptions on the headstones that were still legible. The earliest that I saw was from 1836, and the most recent was dated in 1925, almost a century ago. After this, I headed up to higher ground, where there were dozens of mausoleums framed against the gray sky. It was clear they were testaments to the power and wealth of those who were buried in them. The men who had made their fortunes from textiles and imported goods. Men who needed the world to know how important they were long after the flesh had rotted from their bones inside of their stone tombs. It was fascinating and as the sun began to dip below the horizon, I went home and slept better than I had in a long while. Over the days that followed, I returned to the necropolis and continued my exploration of it. There was one building near what looked to have been the main entrance to the necropolis that stood out as different. It was constructed from stone, but it was not a tomb. There was no grandiose inscription carved into it for a start. It looked to me more like somewhere that somebody would have lived. Perhaps someone who had worked at the necropolis. I wondered. A guarder, a grave digger, or a janitor. Something along those lines. I walked a few times around the building. The windows and its only door were boarded up. But time and the weather had left these barricades worse for wear. I probably shouldn't be doing this, I thought. And then I put my hands into a gap in the boards along one of the side doors and pulled. A loud cracking sound made me freeze. I was alone in the necropolis as far as I knew, but I glanced around nervously anyway. Reassured that there were no witnesses to me breaking into the building, I gave the wood another hard pull. It gave. There was now enough of a gap for me to squeeze through. I breathed in to make sure and I stepped inside. The air was thick with dust and there was a damp, musty smell. Enough daylight trickled in through cracks in the wood over the windows for me to see. There were the remains of a wooden bed frame, a desk, and a chair. There was also a fireplace. Using the torch of my mobile phone, I tried to look up the chimney, but all I could see were spider's webs. I turned my attention to the desk. There was a drawer in one side. It was very stiff, but after a bit of rattling, it moved and I slid it open. I was intrigued to see there was a leather-bound journal inside. It looked old and fragile. So I took it out very carefully and opened it as gently as I could. The handwritten pages inside were faded but still legible. My pulse racing. I began to read. My apprenticeship to the groundskeeper at the necropolis on Chambers Hill began on a summer's day in the year of 1899. I reported to him at the gatehouse at 7 o'clock in the morning feeling excited and nervous in equal measure. Having only known schoolwork before, I had no idea what to expect. Things, I must admit, did not start well. The groundskeeper looked me up and down with an expression of utter disdain on his face. I had washed and combed my hair carefully and put on my smartest clothes, so I had no idea why he was so unhappy with me. And then he said in a gravelly voice, You are an idiot. You'll be covered in dirt before the day is out and your fancy shirt and trousers will be ruined. My heart sank and I said, I'll run and go get changed. He shook his head. There's no time for that, boy. The business of the dead won't wait. And with that, he turned and strode off. I scampered after him, my cheeks burning with embarrassment. I had been brought up in the countryside by my uncle after my parents had died when I was very young, and he had found this job for me and a cramped room in a boarding house. 
but he was growing old and had told me that he could do no more for me. I was on my own from now on and I needed to make a success of the apprenticeship. The groundskeeper was moving at pace in between the headstones which lay all around us. The inscriptions on them blurred as I hurried to keep up. I did not mean to, but I kept standing on these strips of land where the body themselves must have laid. I said sorry each time that I did, as it felt wrong to trample on the resting place. Suddenly, the groundskeeper halted and span around. I stumbled and stopped inches from his sneering face. His breath stank and I could see the broken veins on his nose. He tapped me sharply on the top of the head with his knuckle and asked, Is there something wrong inside here? No, I managed to reply. His sneer grew wider. Then who are you talking to? The dead gentleman and lady, sir, for walking on their graves. I told him and braced myself for another stinging tap on my head. But to my surprise, he laughed. He laughed and he grabbed his sides and he rocked back and forwards as he did. And then he sighed and shook his head and looked me in the eye. And there was not a trace of amusement in his gaze when he said, You can dance a jig on them if you want, boy. They're dead and nothing but a bunch of bones and food for the worms. And then he turned away and started up at an even faster pace than before. I was left confused and sickened. In a few months, a new century would begin. A new age, and yet, here I was in this strange place with this cold and cruel man as my master. But I was young and alone in the world. What could I do? Apart from follow him and not think about what lay below my clumsy feet. We were heading towards the highest ground where the grandest of tombs stood, when I heard a bell ringing. It was a small and quiet sound in the vast space of the necropolis, but there was no mistaking it. I was puzzled enough by it to ask the groundskeeper who was ringing a bell. He shrugged his shoulders in reply and said, It is nature laughing at the foolishness of man and then he pointed at a small headstone, and I realized the sound of the ringing bell was coming from under the ground next to it, from somewhere inside of the grave. The shock on my face must have been clear, because the groundskeeper snorted and said, The man's whose grave this is had a fear of being buried alive, and left instructions that he be buried with a bell. Then, if he awoke in his coffin, he would ring it and help would come. But it is ringing, I began to say. A vision of the terrified man lying in the dark below us, frantically appealing for help filling my mind. The groundskeeper cut me off. I saw him in the chapel before the coffin lid was closed, in his cheap clothes, with his worthless bell placed on his chest. Then he was brought here and buried. That was fourteen days ago when the fellow's dead. There's no question about it. And the only things that can be rattled in that bell today are the rats who had chewed their way into the coffin and are about to enjoy a feast of flesh. He shrugged again and strode away. I stood there feeling dizzy and lost as the bell sounded its lonely toll. And then it fell silent, which felt worse. The rat which was toying with it must have dropped it and moved on to the corpse. I started to feel hot, and then my stomach cramped and I leaned forwards and vomited. The rest of the day passed in a flurry of barked instructions about what my duties were to be, and the many ways that my meager wage would be docked when I did things wrong. I was shown how to dig a grave and left to scramble my own way out of the hole when it was finished, and I had dragged a barrel with the dirt that I had dug, 
up and down the hill for no good reason that I could see, and then I was told to fill the grave back in. More exhausting and frustrating tasks had followed, and it was not until I had been there for more than 12 hours that the groundskeeper finally told me to get out of his sight. I staggered back to the boarding house, fell into the small, hard bed in my gloomy room, and passed into a deep and dark sleep. I did not remember any dreams, but when I woke, the first thing I thought was that my life had become a nightmare. I had been so tired that I had slept in my smart clothes. They were now wrinkled and dirty. I looked down at them inside and couldn't see the point of changing them. I had to go to a wash in the soil from my hands and face and hair, but soon I gave up and trudged out of the boarding house. The summer weather was lingering and there was not a cloud in the sky. It was going to be a beautiful day. Everywhere else but not at the necropolis, I thought bitterly. The groundskeeper was standing outside of the gatehouse. He was putting tobacco into a clay pipe and without looking up from this task, he said, You're five minutes late. Your pay will be docked accordingly. I knew already that there was no point arguing, and I stood there brooding as the groundskeeper handed me a shovel and told me to get a move on. I trailed after him up the hill, where he pointed out where I was to dig a new grave. I took out my frustration on the ground, and in a short space of time, the grave was ready. The groundskeeper had not lifted a finger to help me and I waited for him to give me the next torturous task. But instead, he told me to go sit by a nearby mausoleum and be quiet. Puzzled, I did what I was told and was glad of the chance to rest. I was soaked in sweat and aching all over, and I could have happily fallen asleep. And I was starting to nod off when I heard singing in the distance. I blinked and rubbed my face. The groundskeeper was also paying attention. He was looking down the hill. I followed his gaze and saw there was a small procession heading towards us. Sunlight glinted off a coffin carried on a horse-drawn carriage, behind which walked a dozen or so finely dressed men and women. Some of the party carried delicate-looking parasols, Others held top hats. All were very smartly dressed, and it was they who were singing. As they came closer, I recognized that it was a hymn. I hadn't spotted him at first, but there was also a clergyman with the funeral procession who approached the groundskeeper and thanked him for preparing the grave. He accepted the thanks with a small bow. I, having done all the hard work, watched on and bit my lip as the carriage drew level with the new grave and the coffin was lowered into place. The ceremony that followed was brief but heartfelt and ended with the finely dressed men and women, each gently throwing a rose under the coffin before the procession had left, leaving just me and the groundskeeper standing by the grave. Fill it in, he told me gruffly and then left me laboring alone again. Once the coffin was covered with soil, I wiped fresh sweat from my brow and then swayed on my feet, suddenly feeling dizzy from the heat and my exertions. But there was to be no more rest for me just yet. The groundskeeper hurried me back down to the gatehouse where the headstone for the new grave waited and he made me carry it on my own and install it. More jobs followed and by the time that I was due to finish, I was ready to drop where I stood. I started to leave, but the groundskeeper had stopped me. You're going nowhere yet, he said. Go wait by the new grave while I eat my dinner. Close to tears, I dragged myself back up to that accursed hill and I sat by the grave, 
I didn't think that it was possible to be more miserable than I was as the sun set on the day. Night had settled across the necropolis when the groundskeeper had walked up to me. He held a small lantern, though it was unlit. Dig, he growled at me and pointed at the new grave. I looked at him horrified. He raised a hand threateningly into the air. Dig, he said again, or else I'll crack your skull open. Shivering from head to toe with fear, I began to remove the soil. It was not long before the lid of the coffin with its scattering of roses was exposed. The groundskeeper lit the lantern and handed it to me. Keep it low, he muttered. I don't want it to be seen. And then he clambered down into the grave and cracked open the lid of the coffin. The sound was sickening and sharp in the still night. And then the groundskeeper slid open the lid of the coffin, revealing the dead man within. By the flickering light of the lantern, I could see his pale skin, his closed eyes and lips. He was dressed in a formal and very smart three-piece suit. The gold chain of a pocket watch was draped across his waistcoat. The groundskeeper reached into the dead man's pocket and removed the watch and its chain. And then he went through the rest of the dead man's pockets and took out a silver cigarette case. He also slipped a ring off of his finger. He put all of these in his own pockets, slid the coffin lid back into place and climbed back out of the grave. This robbery was the most appalling thing that I had ever seen, and I stared open-mouthed at the groundskeeper. He showed no sign of shame and looked me straight in the eye. You breathe a word of this to anyone, he said. Then he drew a finger across the front of his neck, leaving me in no doubt what my fate would be if I spoke about the abhorrent crime that I had witnessed. When I finally had returned to the boarding house after filling the grave back in, I did not sleep at all. I hated the fact that I was too scared to do anything about the groundskeeper's desecration. I hated myself. And then the morning came and I returned to the necropolis. There was a bustle of activity already taking place when I had arrived. Stone blocks were being carried in on carriages accompanied by three workmen and a finely dressed gentleman. The groundskeeper skulked in the open doorway of the gatehouse and watched me with hooded eyes as I approached. You remember my words of last night, boy, he said, too quietly for anybody to hear but me. I nodded. Good, he went on. Then go and help these men. They are constructing a new mausoleum, and it will be a fine thing indeed. I will be staying in here. I have my own work to do. As he spoke, I caught the foul smell of alcohol on his breath, and I assumed that he would be spending the rest of his day drinking strong liquor and avoiding any kind of work. This did turn out to be a good thing, because it meant that I didn't have to see him while I assisted the workman and the gentleman who I learned had designed the mausoleum and was there to supervise its construction. He was happy to show me his plans and talk to me about Roman influences and the stone which had been brought hundreds of miles for this project. By the end of the day, I was tired but happier. There was, though, a cloud over my happiness, and a few days later the mausoleum was complete and a man had been laid to rest there. As I watched the funeral party making their way out of the necropolis, I was left feeling sick with anticipation, and once more as I had feared, the groundskeeper ordered me to stay behind as darkness fell, and then made me accompany him to the mausoleum. He broke open the door with a crowbar, but did so in a way that left minimal sign of any damage. It was clear to me that he was a practice thief, and I wondered how many of the tombs and graves around us had he broken into like this. 
Thankfully, he did not force me to follow him inside of the mausoleum. When he had emerged long minutes later, carrying a walking cane with a silver hand grip, a pair of shoes that looked to be made out of the finest leather, and another pocket watch, a fresh wave of repulsion passed through me. He handed me the lantern, told me not to be late in the morning, or else he would have used the new cane on me, and he laughed, and then he strode off towards the gatehouse. I stood there feeling helpless. The dead needed someone to protect them, but I did not have the strength. With this weight on my shoulders, I set off walking down the hill. I had not gone far when I heard a sound that sent a chill through me. It was the bell. It was ringing once more from within the grave. I took a deep breath and went to fetch a shovel that lay nearby. I couldn't stop the thefts, but I could stop the bell from ringing by removing it. This would at least give a little dignity to the poor man who had been buried with it. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. I put the lantern by the headstone to light my way and I set about digging. The bell had fallen silent again by this time, so the only sound was that of my breathing as I labored. A short while later, the lid of the coffin appeared in the dirt, and I reached down to it. At first the lid wouldn't move and it became clear that it hadn't been opened since the burial, which meant the groundskeeper must not have thought this poor soul's coffin was worth breaking into and had left it undisturbed. I whispered an apology for what I was about to do, pried open the lid using the shovel and it began to slide it aside. The sickly sweet smell of decay rose up from within the coffin. I screwed up my face in disgust and moved the lid all the way off. This body was not like the one that I had seen before, which had been freshly interred. This one had been underground for about two weeks. Its skin was ashen and split open in places. Maggots writhed inside the growing hollows where its eyes had been, and its face rippled and bulged because of the insects moving beneath, I knew. I swallowed down the bile that had risen into the back of my throat and tried to focus on the task at hand. The bell that I had come for was resting on the dead man's chest, which was confusing. There were no signs of rats, no signs that anything had disturbed the bell. So how had it rung? I was still wondering this when a beetle had emerged from between the lips of the corpse, followed by a sigh and then a word. You, the dead man whispered, you abandoned me. I gave the sign, I rang the bell, but you left me here to rot. With each word, more insects scurried out of its mouth, and as they laughed, the corpse's voice grew louder. You abandoned me, it said and pointed an accusing finger at me. I was terrified, but somehow... I managed to say, No, no, it was not me. It was the groundskeeper. It must have understood because it turned its sightless gaze away from me, and then it began to sit up. I scrambled backwards and just managed to get out of the way as the corpse climbed out of its grave. I grabbed the lantern and I held it up. By its light, I saw that the corpse held the bell in one of its hands. The flesh of its fingers had begun to fall away, and I could see the bone beneath as it began to ring the bell. The hideous toll cut through the night, and it was joined by the corpse crying out. Vengeance, it screamed. I demand vengeance. And then I heard a scraping sound behind me and span around holding the lantern high, and I saw the mausoleum door slowly swinging open, and the figure of a man stepping out. He was barefoot. A new wave of fear rushed through me as I realized it was the corpse that the groundskeeper had just robbed. 
It began to walk towards the sound of a bell and the dead man calling for vengeance. And it was not alone. The corpse whose watch and ring and cigarette case the groundskeeper had stolen was dragging itself up out of the earth. To one side of it, a dozen graves or so along, a skeletal hand was reaching up. And in front of me, almost by my feet, a skull was emerging from the dirt. And I swear that I heard the word vengeance drift from its mouth. The only light beyond that of the lantern I held in my shaking hand came from the window of the gatehouse in the distance. And it was in this direction that the risen dead had turned and began to walk. Hypnotized by the horrors that I was witnessing, I followed. My legs gave way at one point and I fell, but I picked myself up and I continued in their wake. As I stumbled through the night, I was aware of more and more of the dead joining the grotesque procession until finally they had reached the gatehouse. I could not see what happened then because there were so many of them, but I heard glass breaking and I heard a scream, and then silence settled over the necropolis. No bell rang, none called for vengeance. The dead had had their justice. I stood and watched as they returned to their graves, and they settled back to their rest. And I made a solemn vow that I would watch over them and make sure they were never disturbed again. And then I gathered up the remains of the groundskeeper and buried him in an unmarked grave. No one had cared for him, and my lie that he was probably lying drunk in a ditch somewhere was not questioned. And when he did not come back, I was given his position and the occupancy of the gatehouse. For twenty years and more, I worked hard and tended the necropolis and prepared its ground for many more burials, and I kept my vow. No burial place was ever desecrated, and each night as I waited for sleep to take me, I listened for a bell, but there was only silence. The dead remained peaceful in their graves. He told me I couldn't pronounce his name, so I called him Bob. You have to make fun where you find it in a job like this. And seeing the label Bob slowly applied to the two-story crate that contained this eldritch god, was actually kind of funny. Whether Bob likes it or not, that's his title from onwards. As long as he's here, tagged in our system, he'll only ever be known as Bob. The hissing emergence, the writhing insect mind, the burning hunger beneath the dark. All of these are now just aliases appended to his file. Mold handles for something that once dwelt in a pocket dimension, 6,000 feet beneath the soil of a weathered plateau in western China. Now Bob is just one entry in a long list of things that have been categorized, organized, and dynamized. He claimed he was one of the elder gods who descended onto Earth and helped craft the litany of life that burst out of the Cambrian and that he was once worshipped by a sub-race of humans, possibly the Denisovans. But I don't worship anything, let alone Bob. I got enough of him to finish the entire interview, but like all of them, he kept demanding worship and sacrifice. I think that'll give him a week alone, then have the guys roll his crate out into the open play area, where he can see the other primordial ancient gods at play. I know that he senses them, the others. Most of them will probably leave him alone, provided he doesn't try to bully them at first. But we've got a few with real attitudes and they like nothing more than picking on the new guy. I could sense the anxiety in him as he stood in his cage, pulsing rhythms of flesh rolling in non-Euclidean planes that made my eyes water and my visual cortex throb. I could tell he was uncomfortable. He knew there were bigger fish in the pond and that he was in for a rough ride once he meets them. The thing to remember with these guys is that, if they were in hiding, they probably weren't that big a deal to begin with. It took a small army in three years to excavate Bob, and I think that says everything you need to know about him. 
Agatha. I like Agatha. She's old, she's wise, she's funny. To think that we found her trapped in a cavern beneath Paris. She had been stuck there for over a hundred million years. No stimulation, no entertainment, nothing. One of the other ancient gods just put her there and she couldn't get out, no matter how hard she tried. Until we found her. The first sign of Agatha that came across my desk was a report of unusual drilling by a company hired to maintain Paris's sewage system. They inevitably encountered the catacombs as you do, and through some complicated mess up, they punched a hole into an undiscovered series of subterranean chambers. These weren't man-made and they had nothing to do with the catacombs. Vast open spaces filled with growing lichen and bone-colored stalactites that were three stories tall. A Vernia netherworld hidden beneath one of the world's most populated cities. They're still mapping it out, I believe, but that falls under another department. How it was missed, I'm not sure. Maybe others did discover it, but took one look at the aching darkness and they turned around. That would be the sensible thing to do for sure. Why those construction workers went rooting around down there, I'll never know. But it was about as bad as a decision as anybody could make. I went in with a team three days after they had disappeared. Two guards and one assistant who wouldn't shut up. More than once, the guard on my left flashed me a knowing look. A kind of Jim Halbert, oh boy here we go look. As the assistant voiced another naive inquiry. I rolled my eyes and uh, let the guard and I share the moment. Two experienced agents who found the newbie a little irritating. Those kind of routine social movements, basic human interactions, they're not my cup of tea. But I've learned it's not a bad thing to practice being normal some of the time. Still, the assistant yammered on blissfully unaware just how much he was annoying everyone. I could have told him to stop, but I'm not an idiot. It's like that joke about the two hikers who see a bear, and one of them kneels down and starts to do his laces, so his friend turns and says, What are you doing? You'll never outrun a bear. Then the guy replies, I don't have to. I just have to outrun you. So yeah, I let the assistant chat loudly on as we trekked deeper into the caverns, our path lit by the eerie glow of a fluorescent lichen. What do you think we'll find down here? He asked. Like if we do find an old one, like what type? Eh, probably a ooze. I replied as I palmed the inscriptions on the wall. The torso-sized symbols had been burnt into the stone, with what looked like acid. Like the last one you brought in. The assistant chirped. What was it called? The crawling shadow that dwells beneath our fears. I snorted. It's Alfie from now on, I said before holding up a finger to stop any further questions. I spotted a single point of light up ahead, flickering in and out of life but so clearly visible in the chthonic darkness. When we reached it, we found that it was a single head torch, modern design with its batteries close to dying. Found our missing workers. One of the guards grumbled as he nudged it with his foot. Without speaking, the two men armed their weapons. One slid into point and the other towards the rear. On my direction, we carried but picked up the pace to something less leisurely. I read the entry interview for, um, Alfie. The assistant nervously muttered. It said that it was the progenitor of all cephalopods. Is that true? It makes sense, they're so alien. I rolled my eyes. If I had a penny for every one of these things that claimed to have invented octopuses, I'd be a rich man. But it just makes sense. Their anatomy, especially their distributed central nervous system, it's completely diff. Something lunged out of the darkness to our left. A hairless man clad in torn and dirty overalls. He growled like an animal as he tackled the assistant to the ground and buried his face into the young man's chest. This peculiar method of attack had piqued my curiosity, and I watched with a detached interest as two men writhed on the ground while my assistant squealed and cried in agony. 
The fight, if it was a fight, was going poorly for him. He kept trying to lever his bloody fingers beneath the man's face, struggling to pull the feature of his head away from his chest. Eventually, his screams became uncomfortable and I nodded to the oldest guard who shot the attacker effortlessly. Two hits to the torso, one to the side of the head. The exit wounds weren't typical. They were bloodless punctures, like finger holes in plastic wrap. The attacker still keeled over but his head remained stuck to the young man's chest, almost like it had been glued there. The assistant kept on screaming, a real ear-splitting shriek as he gestured futilely at his chest. Get it off, get it off, it burns. I walked over and tried to roll the attacker off but something had bonded at the two men's skin. Another tug and nothing. Confused and admittedly intrigued, I planted a foot on the assistant's shoulder and pulled with everything that I had. Without having to be told, the two guards came over and they howled. We knew that we were close when the assistant's squealing hysterics pitched to a crescendo, and he passed out for a few fleeting seconds before coming to in total shock. He lay there whimpering as we had finished the job, finally tearing the two men apart with a noise like a boob being pulled out of deep mud. Finally apart, I saw that the attacker's face wasn't a face at all. It was a fingerprint. The ridges dotted with little pea-sized orifices, oozing a clear fluid that smoked and sizzled in the open air. The assistant still lay where we had left him, whimpering as he gingerly probed his ruined chest with quaking hands. The skin was dissolving before our very eyes, and even his sternum began to wilt and sag like wet cardboard. You could see his heartbeat like something out of a cartoon. Oh no, 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 he muttered as he gazed at his own crumbling flesh. I nodded at the guard and he shot him. I take it this is one of the workers, the guard asked as he had nudged the attacker. His leg caught an ID badge that answered his own question, so I merely shrugged and gestured for us to carry on. Half a mile later, we found Agatha playing with the rest of the workers. All of them looked like our attacker, with rubbery, hairless heads resembling giant thumbs without nails. They crawled on hands and knees, using their boneless skulls to pin scuttling and albino rats to the floor, where they digested them alive. The rest of the time, they lay propped against Agatha's quivering ectoplasm, stroking the ridges of their own faces and emitting a muffled whine. Agatha and I spoke for a good while down there. It really didn't take much to get her to agree to a relocation to our facility. One of her bindings held her in place were easily undone, and unlike Bob, there was no need for a crate. She was cooperative. We let her keep the workers that she had gotten her feelers on, and with good behavior, she later got her own studio. The other oozes think she's a teacher's pet and moan endlessly about her special treatment. They don't see what I see. I think it's because her creations don't factor into some ridiculous plan of world domination or the consumption of all life, or some other self-aggrandizing stuff like that. She's an artist. Those construction workers, she didn't reshape their bodies because she wanted worshippers. It was she had just never seen a fingerprint before, and the intricate pattern had struck her as beautiful. Everything she did afterwards was simply an exploration of aesthetic and function. I mean, those men are still alive. Vestigial mouths opening and closing behind a thick layer of leathery skin, their eyes withered and useless forced to rely on their touch and sound to track their prey. Many of them have given up scrawling desperate messages for us to reverse what Agatha did to them. As the years have gone on and they've accepted their fate, gleefully gobbling up whatever medical waste we throw on their cages, a few have even given into the new and peculiar reproductive cycle that Agatha had dreamed up for them. Imagine that, a whole new self-sustaining species made for no reason other than whimsy. That's what I mean when I say Agatha is an artist. I've talked a lot about the Uzes. They're a good set of ancient gods to start with, but if I'm honest, they're a little overhyped. Outside of Agatha, none of them really interest me. 
They're just single-celled organisms with projections into fifth, sixth, and seventh dimensions that allow them to host biochemical reactions otherwise impossible in real space. One of them, I'm pretty sure, is a skin cell shed by some passing cosmic monstrosity that visited our solar system a few billion years ago. Agatha confirmed the general direction of this theory, but it's a struggle to get any real details on what that thing might have been. Still, we have other eldritch abominations and ancient gods. Lots. Take Keith, for example. He's a strange one. It wasn't even that long ago that my newish assistant was asking about him. She had glimpsed his face, walking past his door and, understandably, was confused by the sight of an Asian male age 30, wearing a checkered shirt, slim-fitting jeans, and a polite smile. But why is his containment cell so much stronger than the others? She asked after I explained that she had just met a god named Keith. A fur Faraday cage built into the walls, I said, and about a hundred other technologies. He couldn't physically break out, of course. But it's important he doesn't feed on the workers here, and that takes a little extra pizzazz. He's polite enough. A strange fellow, though. For one thing, I didn't name him. He picked Keith himself. Most people assume that was me, but nope. He picked it. Feed? She repeated with a frown. What does he feed on? Generally, I find that the problem with assistance is that you can't train them, or rather, there isn't any point. Even the most highly trained expert will only last less than five years under my supervision. So I end up going with people who have only a passing knowledge of the ancient gods, which is fine, of course. I'm not going to penalize anyone for ignorance. But the questions... Good God, the questions. So I told her to let Keith out and to see for herself. After that, I loaded her up with the relevant equipment and told her to shadow him for three weeks and to not call me for a second before the allotted time was over. She rang three weeks later and much to my own amusement, I realized that I had forgotten about her. I had even hired a new assistant. To think that I had spent days avoiding accounts because they insisted that our budgets were out of line. We had a good laugh about that. Anyway, I found her sat on some country road, sobbing her eyes out. Keith was beside her wearing a priest's outfit. His face was Caucasian, but it was slowly sliding back into his original appearance, with each passing second. Keith's default face is a loose average of all humans currently alive. He sat there drumming a little rhythm on his knees while my assistant rocked back and forth hyperventilating. How was it? I asked as I knelt down in front of her. I don't... I don't... Have you figured it out yet? I asked. I don't... Oh, for goodness sake. I groaned and then gestured for my newest assistant to take notes. Have Psycheville take a look at her and if need be, arrange for euthanasia. Grab her stuff though. We're still going to have to clean this up. The equipment that she has will let us track the guy. Oh... Oh, all right, he stammered. But we have the god contained, don't we? He pointed at Keith, who was starting to dance a little jig to his knee drum song. Eh, Keith isn't the problem, I said. It's whoever he's been impersonating. A priest, I assume, from the outfit. Keith heard his name and gave me a wave and a nod. Keith likes identity, I said while returning the wave. He consumes a person's unique character from the collective consciousness of our species. He takes over their lives, while they're basically erased from existence. The result is that the victim can't be recognized anymore, and neither can the consequences of their actions. If you talk to someone, they can't hear it. If you take the food out of their hand, they'll think that they ate it. If you steal their car, they'll think that they never owned one. They can't even get sick because bacteria and viruses won't recognize their existence. The average person goes into a deep state of despair upon realizing this. Oh, my new assistant nodded. For about a week and then they start to think about the moral implications of their actions, I added. And that's when stuff gets nightmarishly dark. It's the kind of stuff that warrants an A4 page of trigger warnings. 
I walked over to my weeping ex-assistant and nudged her with my foot. You aren't able to tell us where he went, are you? I mean, you're here. You must have been observing the guy pretty close. I don't. I don't. I don't. Keith, what about you? Hi. I laughed. It was always worth a try, but Keith was about as sapient as a coffee table. Gods aren't always smart. What about you? I asked my new assistant. You didn't happen to bring a map of the area. Actually, I did, sir, he chirped. There's a restaurant a few miles down the road. I shrugged while looking at the map that he held open. I doubt that's it. Too many roads. Three quarters of all of Key's victims die by car within the first week. This guy's gone 21 days, so he must have figured the basics out. Uh, there's a farm a little nearer, he replied. I shook my head. No, that doesn't sound right. If he wanted to bugger his sheep, he could have just visited a petting zoo. We are in the middle of nowhere. There must be something in this area that would draw him here. Probably somewhere he visited regularly as a part of his day-to-day -day life as a priest. Oh, well, it seems that if you're willing to cross a few open fields, there's a care home for the elderly some miles east. I let out a sign that came from deep within my bones. That's the one, I said. Uh, come on, let's go. 18 hours later and I was back in my office and Keith was locked up again. Unfortunately, I lost the new new assistant to clearing out the care home. So that was two assistants lost from just one bad decision. The poor guy couldn't hack what he saw in that place. But what can I say? Why do people do such messed up fruity and stuff the second they realize they won't be held accountable? I don't know. But it doesn't speak volumes to our species character. Like I said though, Keith is a great ancient god, a real compelling character. Best guess to his origin is that he's the equivalent to those camera drones, that they dress up as hippos and other dangerous animals to get footage for a documentary. He's pretty decent at impersonating a human, but five minutes of real conversation makes it apparent that he's dumber than a bag of rocks. Does that mean some great entity is piloting him from another dimension? Maybe. It's only a theory. Whatever he is, he's polite and I appreciate that he's an eldritch god. We have other kinds of ancient gods and eldritch abominations. The machine ones are fun. Most of them are just massive piles of rusted cogs that vomit oil and blood, or are led into some ancient in-between dimension, where everything looks like a crappy hotel. But some of them are actually really quite fascinating. A few are even legitimately dangerous. Our organic computer unsettles even me. It's wily, a genuinely fascinating piece of equipment that some German cobbler in 13th century Berlin made using the nervous system of his wife, three children, and four very unlucky victims. What on earth compelled him to do this we'll never know. But he hanged himself the day it was finished and I can't blame him. It's a bloody ugly thing to look at. A quivering mixture of putrefied jelly and cartilage that whispers all sorts of filth from mummified orifices that, uh, well, let's just say they make for a crappy conversation. It's bloody awful to see those puckered holes trying to spit out lurid truths that drive men mad. It's like listening to Almer Fudd recite the Necronomicon. And to top it all off, the thing only speaks German. So, of course, I had to hire someone with a German language skills who also had a doctorate in computer science, another doctorate in historical languages, and I hoped was a strong constitution. Initially, he wasn't very keen on doing the job, but I locked him in there for a few minutes, and after that, he was very interested. We already had a rough idea that the computer somehow deduced and formulated a secret knowledge, usually catered to appeal to the nearest individual. The CIA worked with us for a while trying to use it to get state secrets, but they deemed it ethically problematic and not worth the human suffering. Either way, this thing presumably spoke to the young upstart and convinced him that it was worth his time with promises of getting to see God's face or some rubbish like that. Once he agreed, I set him up to try and get the computer to cooperate with our rehab program. It must have been able to do something useful. I had thought, but maybe you could crunch numbers for the stock market, or test experimental medication. 
I just figured that it would all work out once the guy got to grips with the computer's inner workings. Unfortunately, I really do wish that I had seen this coming. We accidentally let him install an ethernet port into the machine. It had been asking for years, you see, but no one was ever stupid enough to agree to it. And of course, all material requisitions have to first go by me, even if it's just for an extension cord. But there are so many of these requests, and I don't have the time or the temperament to review them all in detail. So somewhere along the line, this guy got enough resources to give the dang thing internet access. I didn't notice at first, I mean nobody did. I am juggling literally hundreds of these things on any given day, and I can't even keep track of every little side project. I assumed the computer scientist was doing his job, or he had gotten careless and was now living a new life as an organic CD-ROM drive. Instead, he had given the monstrous little MacBook a hardwired connection to the World Wide Web, and it immediately got up to all sorts of mischief. Even now, we don't really know everything that it did. We're 99% certain that it made copies of itself, and we're still hunting those down. And some researchers connected it to a very troubling cryptocurrency scheme. But it was the hospital that sticks with me. A little girl in New Delhi was getting fitted for a cochlear implant when this thing snuck a neurolinguistic virus into the machine's firmware. If you're not familiar, those implants basically make a, for a direct connection between a hearing aid and the human brain. They're miraculous devices, really. A bit of surgery and boom, a person can hear. Of course, having your head cracked open requires lots of bed rest afterwards. Three weeks, I believe. Our contact was lost with the hospital after the fourth day. We only mobilized once I finally realized what the thing was trying to do. The connection is definitely severed. I remembered asking the words as we pushed through the glass doors into the hospital's lobby. The entrance was open for barely a few seconds, but I could feel the entire battalion of armed soldiers behind us tense nervously as we stepped through. Only once the door was shut and locked down did I get the feeling that they had relaxed. But that left my team and I on the other side, and even though New Delhi was scorching at that time of the year, it was cold enough to see our breath. I guess the sudden change in temperature must have taken the others by surprise, because I had to repeat my earlier question. We definitely got that computer off the internet right. I asked in one particularly nervous hazmat suit, fumbled for their tablet and nodded. The surgical team finished removing the port 16 hours ago, they said, and all other tests have shown that there were no redundancies or backups. Now they're asking what they should do with the computer scientist. What does that mean? While he's still alive, he's, um, they're saying that he's in pain. They think they can remove him from the machine, but they're not sure that he'll survive. It's, uh, it's apparently integrated itself with most of his nervous system. He was in there for six full weeks. I shone my light across the lobby and saw overturned chairs lit only by the flashing amber lights that declared the hospital was in a state of emergency. Otherwise, the hospital was trapped in an oppressive darkness that seemed ready to swallow us all. Despite my experience, my breath caught in my throat. I could feel it. The ambient pain and misery. Something awful had been let loose and not only were we stuck in that building with it, but we had no choice but to head right towards something that gave even me nightmares. Leave Anna, I said. It'll be a good reminder to the next guy that I hire. When you negotiate with these things, you don't give them what they want without checking why they want it. I could hear the tension in my voice, my fear escaping whether I wanted it to or not. The nervous figure nodded and tapped a few keys. I couldn't see their face, but I guessed that they weren't happy to realize their boss was prone to doling out literal lifetimes of unspeakable agony. At least the guards were a bit more focused. Eight of them armed to the teeth and all fairly experienced. They were painting the walls with their flashlights and slowly mapping the different ways in and out of the lobby. They had their own frequency, so I wouldn't be overwhelmed with every bit of chatter, but I could tell from the subtle bobbing of their heads that a lot was going back and forth. What's the plan, guys? 
I asked, not wanting to linger in that graveyard atmosphere for one second longer. We have heat signatures in that pediatrics. Survivors? My assistant asked. I doubt it. I said to my assistant before gesturing to the guards and telling them to pick a door. One of the men turned his weapon and its light towards the most obvious exit, and we began our journey into one of the worst places that I've ever been. I've seen a lot of awful stuff, but it was the quiet that bothered me the most about that place. Most sites that I visit are a violent eruption of body horror and contagious nightmares. Communicable cancer that lumps people together, like pieces of raw bread dough. Contagious ideas that cause needles to spontaneously erupt out of your flesh. A hole in the ground that has no bottom, but demands the most peculiar sacrifices. I took those sorts of things in my stride, but those silent halls terrified me. Maybe it was because I had an inclination as to what the computer's goals were. We passed room after room devoid of any living soul, and over time it became clear that there had been something of an exodus. Gurneys with bloodstains and bedpans knocked over, their contents half frozen into the floor. IV bags left dripping where the needle had been torn out and left dangling. Blood streaked walls and beds with outlines of sweaty, unwell people who were nowhere to be found. At one point, we found what I think was an open heart surgery patient who had heeded the same terrible call as everyone else, including his surgeons who did not bother to close him up. He must have awoken hours after everyone else late to the party, but that didn't deter him. He rolled off the bed and crawled desperately. He didn't even remove the metal bar holding his ribcage open. He got a few meters before dying. When I flipped him over with my foot, I saw ribs splayed open like an ivory Venus flytrap, his organs covered in a thin veneer of frost. Dead as a doornail, his lips blue and his eyes cloudy from ice, and yet somehow he looked happy to be lying there in his own offal. I grimaced at the sight and tried to put it out of my mind but the glee in his eyes still haunts me. How far are we from pediatrics? I asked the guard. It's one floor up, a guard replied. Are we still getting a heat signature? He nodded. The stairwell was full of random bits and pieces. Pencils, phones, shoes, watches. All manner of little things that people left behind as they rushed the door in a terrible crowd. I saw a few teeth, a few spatters of blood. It all led to that one place. Inside the corridor was a mass, just like the stairwell. Nearly a thousand people had converged on one doorway at the end. Along the way, paintings had been torn off the walls. Doors were put through so much strain that they buckled and broke. There were even bloodied handprints on the ceilings from where the crowd, hitting a bottleneck, had surged upwards as well as sideways into walls and through locked doors. They had flowed through the hospital like a flood. What could make people do this? My assistant asked as we started to spot the first few people whose bodies had fallen and been unable to get back up. Crushed beneath the feet of the crowd, their corpses made for an ugly sight. Mostly, they looked like they had been elderly. At least if these silver hair matted into it was anything to go by but a few of them were too small to be anything other than children. That computer has spent the last few hundred years trying to speak to God, I said. It's been screaming his name on and off for the last few decades. Sometimes it'll cook up little side projects for fun, but mostly it all comes back to that singular goal. I turned to the armed men behind me. Tell the team outside to prep our facilities and teams for the Abraham procedure. There was a bustle of activity as each one reached to radios and tablets and began sending messages. Once it had faded and silence returned, I gestured for us all to carry on. I wouldn't bother, I said when I saw my assistant trying to take steps between the increasingly frequent bodies. It's only going to get worse. And it did. Until the last, there was no floor to see. There was only a carpet of discolored gowns and broken humans all of them victims of some unseen compulsion, drawing them towards those doors. Two of them, each with a window painted black with blood and flesh. 
and just beyond lay our heat signature. Oh, it actually did it, didn't it? I muttered to myself as I suppressed a shiver. Pardon? My assistant asked. Come on, I said, trying my best to seem chirpy. Let's go speak to one of God's representatives. Inside was a little girl who paced like a tiger in a zoo. She didn't smile when she saw us, but she did stop and stare at us with eyes that could appear steel. Oh boy, I muttered, secretly glad that no one could see the sweat pouring down my face. A survivor? My assistant asked and I wondered if he paid any attention to his surroundings. Much like outside this room had been coated with what seemed like half a foot of blood, meat, and muscle. But unlike outside, this flesh was still twitching. Uh, nope, I said as I put a hand across his chest to stop him from rushing towards her. It isn't like me to intervene on behalf of somebody else's stupidity. But then again, I don't like losing leverage either. It's the girl, he said. The one with the implant that you identify. Nope, I repeated. He looked closer. Perhaps coming to appreciate the absolute monstrous expression of hatred it painted on her face. That girl would have been the first to go, I said. Her head was used to emit sounds that only they can hear. I gestured to the girl-shaped illusion that had now resumed its pacing. A summoning for an angel. Something anyone with half a brain cell would never do. And unfortunately, this summoning worked. And when the angel arrived and realized that it had been caught in a trap... It would have smashed whatever was making that noise into pieces. And then it would have summoned every living human that it could to try and find whoever it set the bait. And for every person that couldn't help it, they would have gotten angrier and angrier and angrier. Until, my assistant asked, until some arrived to inspect the trap. We could, we could just let it go, he replied. The girl stopped pacing once more and looked at us. It would kill us if we were lucky, I said. I thought angels were good. These things are puppeteers, I said. They can play our nervous system like a fiddle and make us see or feel anything they want us to. They can take us apart and put us back together in any arrangement that they feel like. Because whatever put us on this earth left them behind so they could impregnate unwitting teenagers split the Red Sea, and conjure whatever other miracles were needed. They were meant to be our caretakers like we were meant to be the caretakers of Earth. That sounds like good guys. Think about how we've treated planet Earth, I snapped. Think about how we treat the birds and the animals. Think about industrial farming. Think about how we treat dogs. Castration, sterilization. We breed them into disability force them into incest, clip their ears and break their tails, euthanize them when it's convenient, breed them when it isn't. And they, pointed to the girl, like us, a heck of a lot less than we like dogs. Let me go. I knew we had been compromised the second we saw the girl as a girl and not a scuttled in erect and monstrosity larger than most cars. But I still jumped at the sound of that thing's voice. It meant that it had a direct wiretap into our minds. Angels don't do wireless, everything is physical. Somewhere in that room were organic filaments thinner than hair, but tougher than steel and they had already breached our suits, and they were communicating directly with our brainstems. Uh, no, I replied. Letting you out means that my final moments will be painful. But you're weak, that much is clear. And we've been pumping all sorts of nasty stuff into this place for two days straight. And I'm pretty sure that's why I'm not trapped in a literal nightmare of eternal suffering and degradation. Let me go. And we're open to negotiation. I said with a cheerful tone stolen from the barista that I visited every morning. For a second, the illusion flickered in and out. The girl disappeared and we all glimpsed a bramble like knot of chitinous legs that concealed some unseen central mass. Only each limb was as thick as my thigh and covered in undulating hairs and glistening black eyes. I felt an overwhelming desire to kneel. We will let you go, I said, if you allow us to go unharmed. We can shut the trap down. We have its creator and it has shown us how. 
but we won't do that if it just means you're going to kill us. The barrage of images it put into my mind is a response to this. Let's just say that it made Keith's last victim look like a boy scout. Most of eldritch abominations don't have feelings the way that we understand them, but angels do. They were deliberately sculpted to understand us and our world so they can better manipulate it from behind the scenes. They're not alien, they're worse. They are jealous and despiteful, incapable of putting these emotions to work on an unprecedented scale. This is the kind of hatred that prompts invisible genocides over some misplaced tea. Whole ethnic groups have been permanently scrubbed from our history because of these things. I'm talking violet eyes and naturally blue hair. Gone. All gone. We don't even remember them. If it wasn't for Agatha, neither would I. We could kill you, I said. You're not immortal, you're just a thing like us. Biological matter that can come undone just as easily. Not quite as easily. Your official designation by the others. You know the others, I replied. The blobs and the goat-footed breeders who go scuttling in dark places. The dwellers in the deep. The primordial oozes who were here long before you. They call you Exodida after tax. That's how they see you. You're a parasite like the kind of farmer has to protect his sheep from. That makes you livestock. Still, we are at an impasse, I said. You're dying. Even as I spoke, I could feel the facade of my plan start to crumble. There was no easy way out of this situation, and I had entered it terrified as to how I was going to make it work. Angels are a sophisticated species, and they would be deeply unhappy to know that a bunch of primitives had gotten the better of one of their own. I had hoped to try out some kind of negotiating, but that would be like one of us negotiating with a stray dog that had bitten a child. No matter what happened, if this angel died, I could count on the others finding me. And that would be a best case scenario, living a day or even a week. Unfortunately, I didn't even get that far. Without even appearing to move, the angel unmade the guards. I've thought about this a lot, believe me but there's no other way that I can describe it to you. They were pulled apart into their disparate tissues in the blink of an eye. A bloodless vivisection that struck the room like an explosion. Muscle, bone, eyes, teeth, skin, nerve endings. They were thrown against the walls and subsumed into the living carpet of flesh all around us. I had to suppress a whimper as I realized that it was still alive, possibly even aware. Beside me, my assistant fell to his knees and began to weep, but I knew that no amount of begging or praying would change the angel's intentions. We just had to hope that it would be relatively quick and that the consequences wouldn't be. Your mind tastes awful, it boomed. The words so loud I fell to my knees as my willpower had crumbled. Not like the others, how assuming. It has been so long since I bothered to keep a pet. It agreed to your terms. My boss has sat before like three judges at a tribunal. A man and two women with faces that looked like they had been carved out of granite. The boardroom was supposed to be a professional environment where meetings could be had with other relevant departments. But in truth, they just turned into the site of a disciplinary meetings like this. Yeah, something like that, I replied. Why? One of them asked. Well, he was younger than we thought just a few hundred years old, and thankfully for us, something of a history buff. That's why he heeded the signal from the hospital in the first place. Apparently the creator is something of a taboo topic in their culture. He was hoping to learn a little more about it all. He has been thrilled to enter our organization from within and peruse our archives. And none of his and none of the others have come looking for him, the men asked. No need. He's alive and well and enjoying himself. Business as usual. There was a knock on the door and I turned to see my assistant poking his head through. He waved and smiled and showed me the tray of coffee that he wanted to bring in. I smiled back and gave him a thumbs up. We were always led to believe that angels and other Abrahamic abominations were not on the cards for this organization. Will he have trouble working with the program? One of the bosses asked as the young man placed the tray down and began to distribute drinks. 
Well, unlike others, they're actually very well versed in human mannerisms and our society. Not much rehabilitation to do, really. And of course, they can appear however they want, so long as they have a direct line of sight. I answered. A lot of the time, they let our mind do the heavy work. We fill in the necessary blanks. If they appear as policemen, we'll see everything we need to in order to support that idea. A gun, badge, and so on. Ultimately, it's our own minds that make their disguises so convincing, without them even having to move. And what are you calling him? This angel. Muriel. My boss's eyes went wide as they processed the voice that had been inserted directly into their mind. One by one, they lowered their drinks and turned to face my assistant. Even I, who had spent days with the walking nightmare, could not suppress a shiver. Uh, sorry, he said before coughing to clear his throat. Force of habit, I like Uriel. He told me that I couldn't pronounce his name. I explained as my assistant stood behind me and placed a single hand on my shoulder. I tried to ignore the taste of copper in my mouth and the intense itch at the back of my neck. So I let him pick an appropriate and respectful alternative. <laughs>